Welcome, welcome. I can see a very distinguished guests exchanging pleasantries. Welcome. I kindly advise that some of us at the back kindly come forward so that we can have good photo optics. Please, for the people at the back, kindly come forward. Don't leave any spaces in front of you. Kindly come forward. Please kindly come forward. Welcome, welcome. I like people from Port Harcourt. You are very punctual and I celebrate you for being here by 2 p.m. Please, can you give yourself a round of applause, please? Your Excellencies, very distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to the 12th edition of the Emmanuel Igboga Legacy Lecture Series. Of course, the edition, this edition is proudly brought to you by the Emmanuel Iboga Foundation in collaboration with the Society of Petroleum Engineers Nigeria Council. As a background, the EEF Foundation was established in the year 2019 and continues to honor the legacy of Dr. Emmanuel Iboga aimed at anchoring the principles of prosperity for posterity. Please, can we give him a round of applause? And of course, the SV has the mission of collecting and exchanging technical information concerning the exploration and production of oil and gas for public benefit. On behalf of SP, on behalf of EF, I say a warm welcome to all of our very distinguished participants from all walks of life, and of course, our virtual participants who have joined online. I'm gonna just walk up to two people here. Two people here, you're gonna do me a favor. The first question I'm asking you is, what legacy so, yeah, so Dr. Coming, Emmanuel yeah, Iboga so. do you appreciate yeah. so much and still remember till today? So I just need two people, a male and a female, to give me that response. And then online to understand that our virtual participants are hearing us. For those online, the question is, which part of Nigeria are you joining us from? And what legacy of Dr. Iboga do you still remember to today? So who wants to try in the hall? Two people? Two people? The first, let me see. I'll walk to you with the microphone. Okay, sir. Okay, I'm coming. What attributes of Dr. Emmanuel? Do you still remember? My name is uh, Professor Nyu Wampa, the Department of Music. His attributes are many, but I'll just mention two. Humility and service. Thank you. Humility and service. It deserves a round of applause. Okay. Any female? Just one female? Going? You want to speak? Okay. Okay. I'm Dr. Dutola Twing um, from Emerald Energy Institute. I, well, one of the attributes I remember, I remember meeting him in 2012. I was doing my um, PhD then in IPS. And it was a very, very inspiring meeting. And I still remember his, I was heavily pregnant there. I still remember all his advices. And I strongly believe that um, his advices has helped me move this far, so far. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. A man of humility who we keep honoring. Do we have any comments from the virtual participants? We don't have any yet. I hope they are hearing us. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the theme for today's event is climate change and the geopolitics of energy transition. I want to assure you that we have an array of very distinguished speakers, very distinguished professionals, who I believe will do justice for today's event. I want to assure you that today's event was very, very brain stimulating and, of course, exciting. Of course, we are in the energy industry, and I'm going to kickstart this event by giving us some housekeeping announcements and, of course, establish a little bit of protocols, and then we continue with the proceedings for today. Very first is that you are live at the Emmanuel Igbogo Auditorium in the Emerald Energy Institute Uniport. We have no planned drills for today. Of course, should we have any kind of emergency, we don't plan for that. The personnel from this facility will guide us to the muster point, and I kindly appeal that we follow him. We have two exits out of this hall, 
the one by my left and the one on my right. I kindly advise that we all use just the one by my left as we have hindrances on the one by my right. When you leave this hall going out and you turn right and turn left, you get to the male and female convenience. I also advise that you kindly and kindly put off or put to silence all of your weapons of mass destruction. I speak of the mobile phones, put it on silence, put it on silence. And of course, for our virtual participants, you also advise that you leave your device on mute so that you don't interfere during the course of our deliberations today. Also advise uh, virtual participants that should you have a comment, use the C in front of your comment. And for a question, use the Q before your question. And of course, it will be attended through throughout the course of this event. And for the in-person participants on your so left, on your right, you see some ladies on black. Kind of ask the questions, and of course, they will be at your service. This juncture, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to switch gears immediately to having the national anthem. And after the national anthem, I will recognize some dignitaries and lead them to the head table. IT? Okay. I kindly appeal that we please rise as we honor our father land. <laughs> Federal Republic of Nigeria. May God bless the University of Port Harcourt. 
May God bless the Emmanuel Eboga Foundation. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm supposed to continue with recognizing distinguished personalities that have joined us here today. But I'm to understand that one of our very own is coming in. He is on his way here. So I would leave you in the hands of our IT for a little music interlude, and then I'll be back. But before then, our virtual participant, are you hearing me? If you're hearing me, kindly drop a comment on the chat box. Tell us where you're joining from and what you hope to gain from today's event. I would like to confirm they are hearing me. Okay, so I want to see your comments, virtual participants. Let us know where you're joining on from, which part of Nigeria, and let us know what you hope to gain from today's event. If possible, IT will project it, and we would all see your thoughts. Today's event, we'll be having and learning from distinguished industry personalities. Okay, I can see our comments. Daniel Ndefo from Lagos. Lagos, we see you. What do you hope to gain from today's event? What do you hope to gain from today's event? Why did you decide to tune in from all parts of Nigeria? I can see so many names from Lagos, from Delta, from Abuja. Okay, I'm still reading. I'm still reading your comments. I'm still reading your comments as you await the arrival of the chief host for today's event. I made to understand that he's already in the building. And once the chief host steps in, I will continue recognizing all of the distinguished personalities that are here. This is Professor Godwin Igwe from Delaware, USA. I hope to hear from Prof. Ibe current ideas on climate change. Prof. Ibe, you have so many people joining online because they want to hear from you. I am Felix Douglas from Lagos. I'm hearing you very clear here, and I hope for a fruitful, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, would like to give a resounding round of applause for the arrival of our chief host, the professor of pharmacology and toxicology, the ninth vice chancellor of the University of Port Harcourt, Professor Wunari Georgiou. Welcome, sir. You may please have your seat. I will continue recognizing delegates. Please, as I recognize you, you may please wave your hands so that our ushers can guide you to the head table. I'd like to say a warm welcome to the Managing Director of New Cross Exploration and Production Limited, the Chairman of the 12th Emmanuel Iboga Legacy Lecture Series, the person of Mr. Victor Sojay. Of course, I made to understand that he's represented by the Managing Product Manager Production Operations Engineer Enya Ojiji. With a round of applause for him, please direct him to the head table. Welcome, sir. We celebrate you. I'm also made to understand that we have the Honorable Commissioner for Education here with us. Please help me welcome Professor Prince Chinedu Mob. I'd like to ask that you wave your hands wherever you're seated so that the OSHAs can guide you to the head table. We also say a warm welcome to our keynote speaker for today. Of course, we're going to learn so much from him. He's a professor of oceanography and the blue economy. Of course, an industry expert on energy, Environment and climate change. Please help me welcome to Head Table Professor Chidi Ibe. Keep celebrating this outstanding personality. Thank you, sir. We also celebrate and welcome with us the Executive Director of Emmanuel Iboga Foundation. Welcome, Professor Wumi Elidare. Welcome, sir. I would like to kindly request that you join the OSHAs to the Head Table. Still here with us, 
is the chairman of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Nigerian Council. I made to understand that he would be represented, of course, by the Council Secretary of SPE in Nigeria. We'd like to welcome to the head table, Engineer Daniel Abia. Mr. Round of applause for him. Oh, my head table is already filled. Okay, okay. And of course, we also like to say a warm welcome to the Emmanuel Bogache in Petroleum Engineering, University of Port Harcourt. And of course, the Vice Chairman Board of Trustees, Emmanuel Igoga Foundation, is representing all of the Board of Trustees of this foundation. We say a warm welcome to Professor Joseph Ajenka. Welcome, sir. We celebrate you. We also welcome a mini round table panel chairman. Please, for these distinguished personalities, we would be sitting on the front row or the second row. So if you're not seated in the front or the second, the ushers, can you wave your hands so that the ushers can direct you to any of the seats? We'd like to welcome a mini round table panel chairman, the managing consultant, Wetcon Petroleum Limited, Professor Adewale Dusumu. Welcome, sir. We celebrate you. Okay, okay. Of course, the panelists are ready to share from their wealth of knowledge. We'd like to say a warm welcome to the principal consultant and the CEO, Reservoir and Facility Solutions Nigeria Limited, engineer Mrs. Lushei Afolabi. Welcome, ma'am. Warm welcome to you. We celebrate you. Of course, the first female I'm recognizing today. Thank you for being part of this event. I made to understand that two of our panelists are joining virtually, and I would like to say a warm welcome to the Executive Director of Operations, Triple E Systems Associates Limited, Professor Felix Dio. Welcome, Prof. You can say hi online or wave your hand online. We celebrate you. We also like to welcome a lead promoter, Energy Hub, and of course, the co-founder, AOGS Energy Resources Limited. He's also the Executive Chairman of Entech Integrated Resources Limited. I speak of Dr. Felix Ameyo Fori. Welcome, sir. I made to understand he's also joining virtually. I'd like to welcome all of the sponsors that have agreed to sponsor today's event. Please, can we celebrate all of our sponsors for agreeing to sign the check that has allowed this event to be a success? Speaking of the rep from Walter Smith, Petroman Oil and Gas, please provide your wave your hands. Osha, please direct them. Walter Smith, thank you, thank you for sponsoring this event. You also like to also recognize New Cross Exploration and Production Limited, New Cross Petroleum Limited. Thank you for being a sponsor, a chair for today's occasion. We also like to say welcome to Oida Energy and Zenergy Oil Field Services Limited. Wherever you are, please wave your hands, the rep. Let the ushers bring you to the head table. We'd like to say thank you to Laser Engineering and Resources Consultant Limited. Please, wherever you are, wave your hands. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, Petronet Africa Energy Resources Development Associates Limited. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wherever you are, thank you. We'd like to say a warm welcome to the Managing Director, Kenyon International West Africa Company Limited. Engineer Ikwayong, thank you so much for accepting to sponsor this event. And of course, the last but not the least of our sponsors, Sequest Exploration and Production Services. Please wave your hands. Thank you and thank you. I'd like to welcome all of our very distinguished speakers. I'd like to welcome the Director of Emerald Energy Institute of the University of Port Dr. Chiko Zie Nwauzuzu. Welcome, sir. Please wave your hands. Let the ushers. Okay. Welcome, sir. We also like to welcome all of our virtual participants, speaking of the Emmanuel Iboga family. We welcome the matriarch of the Emmanuel Iboga family, Madam Chirota Emmanuel Iboga. Welcome, ma'am. I know you're online. Thank you for being part of us today. We also welcome Dr. Emeka Iboga, who's the chairman, board of trustees of the Emmanuel Iboga family. We welcome the manager of EEF, Dr. Susan Fubara, all members of the board of trustees of this foundation, senior and professional members of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, Nigerian Council, 
for time i may not be able to call of all of the captains of industry here present we celebrate you and we welcome welcome all of our students members all of the students from uniport thank you for being part of us and of course once again i welcome all of our distinguished participants my name is Ofo Fono no Akman, and my pleasure it will be to serve as your master of ceremony for today i meant to understand that the protocol personality from University of Port Harcourt would like to recognize distinguished guest from Uniport. I would like to welcome the PRO from Uniport. Please round of applause for him as he does the welcome and I'll be back after he's done. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to the unique University of Port Harcourt. And let's come back home. Uh, it is my pleasure to especially recognize other distinguished personalities we have here from the University of Port Harcourt. And of course, our vice chancellor is already stay here, the night vice chancellor. And of course, you understand that in one of the latest rankings that was done, University of Otago was at George number one in Nigeria, number one in Nigeria and 19 in Africa. So we are doing very well. Thank you so much, sir. It is a pleasure. I also want to inform us that we have the deputy vice chancellor of research and development in our midst here today, Professor Iyopu Semilae. In our midst today, we have the Registrar of the University, Dr. Gloria Chinda. I also want to use this opportunity to also inform us that in our midst today, we have very senior professors here. I mean senior professors and directors of centers of uh, an institute already sitting here. Let me briefly recognize the presence of an elder scholar, Professor M. Ikekwe, in our midst today. You're welcome, sir. Yes, he was, uh, you know, the editorial chair of the Unipod News, the flagship magazine of the university. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. We also have one of our brightest in our midst here today. A lot of people are here. Let me briefly recognize the presence of uh, one of our petroleum engineer we have in this part of the world. He's also seated here in our midst today. And we are really so delighted to have him, Professor Mike Onyeko, who is also seated there. Put your hands together for him. Thank you very much. Let me very briefly recognize the immediate past director of uh, University of Portugal Foundation is also in our midst today. Professor Yanso is also sitting here. It's a pleasure. And of course, we have the director of C4 Center Leader, Professor Agbagba is also sitting here. It's my pleasure to welcome you. The director of Youth Friendly Center, Professor Kunta, is also sitting here. We have other distinguished personalities sitting here today. We also have Professor Iken Simama, is in charge of the Professor Chair of, of uh, Shell, Aret Adams. Thank you, sir. It's a ple pleasure. We also have other distinguished people here. Director of the Nuclear Center, also sitting here. Please, you're welcome, sir. And uh, it is on this note, I want to inform us that we have the director of IPS, Professor Apa Dulu, seated there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As far as my eye can catch, Professor Hart is also here from INRES. Thank you very much, ma'am, for finding time to be here. And of course, the wife of the uh, seventh vice chancellor of the University of Florida, Dr. Mrs. Ajenka, is also seated here in our midst today. So I want to thank you so much for finding time to be at the University of Port Harcourt. All our online viewers, please, you are welcome to the unique University of Port Harcourt. Please, we are very hospitable and friendly, and we promise that we'll, we are going to take good care of you today. Thank you. Let me hand over to the MC assigned for this responsibility. Thank you. Please, can we give our PRO another round of applause? So many professors in one room. So many. With an experience of over 1,000 years. We are so lucky. We are so blessed. Please, can you give all of the professors here a resounding round of applause? I meant to understand that Professor Oyi Wanko is also here. Welcome, sir. Welcome. We celebrate you. The theme for today's event, of course, we are well aware of that. Climate change and the geopolitics of energy transition. So much conversation about this topic lately, energy transition, renewable energies, so much. And I'm not going to bore you. We have distinguished personalities who will do justice to this topic. Of course, to kick start this event, I'd like to welcome for a welcome address, a man who I'll define as a glue who has binded this foundation together. Please, with an applause befitting of 
a reputable gentleman. Let's welcome the Emmanuel Iboga Che in Petroleum Engineering, University of Port Harcourt, Professor Joseph Ajinka, for his brief welcome address. Please give a round of applause, please. Vice Chancellor of this university, the principal officers of the university, the Honorable Commissioner for Education, the chairman of this occasion, and the very distinguished professor, our guest speaker. In an event like this, you have the university PR introducing some people, you have the MC introducing some people. Obviously, you miss out some very important people. Um, in our midst is uh, one of the distinguished alumni of University of Ibadan. Professor Dosmo is the first of the first set of petroleum engineers trained in this country and is going to chair the panel session. But we have engineer Amen Agedo, um, we met at UI. In a, a few weeks ago, and um, it was a great pleasure meeting him. So indeed, you are welcome. This is the first time you are coming to Uniport, I guess. And um, we hope your philanthropic um, gesture will also extend to University of Potakot. I want to very specially welcome uh, one of the panelists. Many of you may not know her, Engineer Mrs. Olusheyi Afolabi, you are particularly welcome. Uh, she traveled all the way from Lagos to come to this occasion. Now, when Igboga was alive, we started holding the Igboga, Emmanuel Igboga Legacy Lecture in this university. It was a very big event, very international. People used to come from the National Institute in a, in a just even military officers used to come and listen to the lecture series. And I want to thank my colleague, Professor Wumi Ledare, for all the effort that have been made to ensure that we get sponsorship for this lecture. But more importantly, I want to draw your attention to the guest speaker of today. You all have the program. I'm sure you have seen his profile. He's a very distinguished professor, Professor Chidi Ibe. Some of you in the university also know him, a former pro-chancellor of Imo State University, a very distinguished scholar, fellow of the Academy of Science, and an international public intellectual. And I'm sure at the right time is the citation, this brief citation will be read about him. When we are looking for who should give this keynote address and he accepted to give this lecture, we're all very happy. And indeed, the Emmanuel Boga Foundation was very happy that he's the one going to give this keynote address. So my duty is to welcome all of us to this event. Our colleagues online, the Boga family online is also participating in this event. But I would like to um, um, end my own part of the welcome address by reading um, something the chairman sent. I'm the vice chairman of the Manuel Boga Foundation. Um, Dr. Meka Egboga is the chairman board of trustees of the Boga, Manuel Boga Foundation. He sent this note, and just a short note, so let me read it to conclude the welcome address. This year marks the fifth anniversary of Dr. Manuel Boga's passing on. He built an illustrious career, amassing several decades, ensuring the economic future of Nigeria, ensuring that the economic future of Nigeria would remain forever bright. And as you know, Dr. Boga was the advisor to President Yaradua on petroleum matters. Um, Dr. Boga chose this university as his own. He chose this university at, at the, the Emerald um, Company adopted this university as its own. 
And so he did so much for this university and indeed other universities. He worked tirelessly to support higher education in the University of Ibadan, in Uniport, Namdi Azikwe University, and other universities. And so he's a Nigerian in whom we have a lot to learn from. His support for higher education was indeed very, very remarkable. And so on behalf of the chairman of the Emmanuel Egboga Foundation, we'd like to welcome you to this lecture, which is the fifth Emmanuel Egboga Legacy Lecture Series. And we hope that, in fact, this year, the SP board accepted to be part of this. And this is why I particularly want to thank uh, um, Engineer Shei, because when we had the board meeting, she insisted that the board should support this venture. And so the SP Nigeria Council is part of the host from this year on, will be part of the uh, group that will be hosting this legacy lecture as a major event of also the SP Nigeria Council. So we would like to welcome all of you, particularly the sponsors. To sponsor an event is not easy, you know? We'd like to thank all of you for sponsoring and believing in the legacy of Dr. Manuel Boga. And we do hope that this university will continue to benefit from its legacy um, and, and, and also grow from strength to strength. So thank you very much. You can give another resounding round of applause, please. Of course, the industry, the industry will continue, will continue to benefit from Dr. Emmanuel Eboga. Unique Uniport, unique Uniport. At this juncture, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome for an opening remark this individual. I would classify him as a personality with a classified modus operandi. He is a ninth vice chancellor of the University of Port Harcourt, a professor of pharmacology and toxicology. Please, with a resounding round of applause, let's welcome Professor Wonaru Josh Wheel for his opening remark. The former Vice Chancellor of the University of Portacot, Principal Officers of the University of Portacot, where you are present, the Chairman of today's event and the keynote speaker. Other very, very distinguished professors, people from the industry. In fact, if you look around this all, I don't even know how to do the introduction. The hall is uh, too loaded for an introduction. But let me say that uh, on behalf of the management, staff and students of the University of Port Harcourt, you are all welcome to this 12th Emmanuel Egboga Legacy Lecture Series. Let me first of all apologize briefly because it's not in our character to come late to events. But as we speak, the House of Representatives, members of other committee are in the University of Port on oversight function. And uh, I had to do all I can to say, yes, oversight us, but let us also go and uh, listen to some lectures and come back. So that's why it appeared as if we came late. Otherwise, we had scheduled this lecture that by 15 minutes to two, we should be here in this hall. But with their presence, you can't just leave them like that. And so we're sorry for coming a bit late. Uh, having said that, let me also recognize the family of this man who has been so many things to this university. I'm sure Emmanuel Egboga, there is nobody that is in this University of Port Harcourt that does not know that man in death, in life and in death. He's a man we owe so much to as a university. For those of us who don't know, 
without him, you wouldn't even be sitting in this auditorium. That is just a little, I want to just say, that if somebody is responsible even for where you are sitting and you also even like the place, a wonderful place, you can imagine who that person is. The investor of that God is grateful and will forever be grateful to him and his family. And on that note, I want to say that um, this Legacies lecture series is something that has come to stay. And this university will continue to host it. We're going to pass it. And that's when I came and I saw a lot of the professors from the university inside. I said, yes, they all know the importance of this man, Egboga. And that's why they are here, whether in life or in death. He remains the famous EE for us. Um, he's a professor, but today you've chosen to call him doctor. But it's okay. He's a professor for us. He's a professor Egboga. But uh, if you call him doctor, we still take it. And so let me once again welcome all of us and uh, give this page to the keynote speaker who is going to take us through all um, what we need to know today. But before I sit, I want to say one thing. This foundation is prosperity for posterity. Thank you very much. God bless all of us. Prosperity for posterity. Please can we celebrate our amazing VC for taking out time of his busy schedule to be part of us today. Switching gears immediately, we'd like to hear from our collaborator, speaking of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Nigeria Council, the pride and effective representation of everybody that works in the energy space. Are you a lawyer? Are you a doctor? Are you a banker? As far as you work in the energy space or you do business in the energy space, you're supposed to be a part of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And of course, they are well represented here. Your Excellencies, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please, can we give a resounding welcome to the Council Chairman of SPE Nigeria Council, ably represented by the Council Secretary, Engineer Daniel Abia. Please give me a round of applause. And you will have your remark now at once, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Please permit me to stand on existing protocols. Um, I must say I am quite very privileged to stand before uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And uh, on behalf of the SP Nigerian Council Chair, Engineer Felix OBK, who is unavoidably absent, he had planned actually during the NAIS when we had uh, the discussion to be in this event but um, work exigencies and other engagements. So let me also tender his um, apologies for not being here. From SP Nigerian Council, we have a lot and we owe a lot of respect, honor to Dr. Emmanuel. He was not just a policymaker to the SP Nigerian Council, but he was a true leader. He was not just a true leader, he was he was able to mirror and develop other leaders for the SP Nigerian Council. Right from his days as the African Regional Director, I think 2006, and many several leadership positions he has um, um, chaired in SP Nigerian Council. As a council, we are yet to recover from all his achievements. And so we are part of this legacy um, engagement and as Nigerian Council, we will continue to be part of this legacy lecture. For SP Nigerian Council, the Council Chairman also extend the gratitude to Dr. Emmanuel. One thing he told me is, I should put it in his words, that as a Council Chair, he will be forever grateful to Dr. Emmanuel, not just for all the roles he played, but for Stripes policies, he helped to structure SP Nigerian Council, which form part of our bylaws and input into our handbooks today. Having said that, I also want to join the Vice Chancellor to welcome everyone to this event, and I look forward to a very productive engagement in this event. Thank you very much.
is that applause befitting an organization that's collaborating to make this event happen? Please give engineer Daniel Labia a pest setter, another resounding round of applause. We're going to switch gears. We're going to move a little bit faster this time. And of course, the very next speech is for the chairman of this legacy lecture series. Please, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome for the chairman's speech, the chairman of the 12th Emmanuel Iboga Legacy Lecture Series, speak of the managing director of New Cross Exploration and Production Limited, Mr. Victor Sojay Ebley, represented by the manager of production operations, engineer Enya Uchiji. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon uh, to the chief host, the vice chancellor, University of Port Harcourt, distinguished guests, and esteemed participants here and uh, online. Um, I'm here representing the managing director of New Cross and the chairman of this uh, occasion today, uh, Mr. Victor Sujay who is unavailably absent, is in Abuja right now, mm -hmm. attending to cease from um, issues with the National Assembly. So he couldn't come, so I'm here to represent him. So I have his uh, keynote address here, and uh, I'll read through it. It is a privilege to welcome you all to the 12th Emmanuel Igboga Legacy Series that explores the intersection of climate change and the geopolitics of the energy transition. Today, we gather not only as concerned citizens of our, of our planet, but as global stakeholders in a world facing profound changes and challenges. The Emmanuel Egogan Foundation, which was established in 2019 by late Dr. Egogan, OON, in a bid to advance knowledge and national capacity of, of managing petroleum and energy resources for optimal economic benefits and maximum social welfare of Nigerian citizens. In context, new cross exploration and production a reliable partner is committed to collaborating with the foundation to broaden the petroleum industry discourse that provides opportunities for the government academia and industry players for sustainable growth and shared prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no news that climate change, as we all know, is no longer just an environmental concern. It is fundamentally inter intertwined with geopolitics and our global energy landscape. The choices we make regarding energy production, distribution, and consumption will shape the geopolitical landscape for decades to come. This webinar represents a unique opportunity to engage in a deep and thoughtful discussion about how the transition from fossil fuels to renewable and sustainable energy sources is reshaping the world order. It is an issue that impacts nations, industries, and individuals in profound ways, and it is consequence uh, its consequences are felt in every corner of the globe. As we delve into the geopolitics of energy transition, we must recognize that this transition is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it offers part to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and mitigating the worst impacts of climate change. On the other hand, it presents complex challenges related to resource competition, energy resources, energy security, and international relations. Throughout this webinar, we will hear from leading experts who will share their insights on how these dynamics are playing out on the global stage. We will explore the changing rules of nations, the influence of renewable energy technologies, and the complex relationship between 
energy producing and energy consuming countries. Our goal is not only to deepen our understanding of these complex issues, but also to identify opportunities for cooperation and sustainable solutions. In addressing the geopolitics of energy transition, we have a chance to reshape our future for the better, fostering stability, cooperation, and more sustainable world for all. Before we commence with our sessions, I would like to express my gratitude to our esteemed speakers and partners who have made this event possible. Your expertise and dedication to this vital cause are deeply appreciated. Now, without further ado, I invite you to engage fully in the discussions, ask questions, and share your thoughts. Let us use this platform to explore, learn, and collaborate, for it is together that we can navigate the challenging waters of climate change and the geopolitics of energy transition. Thank you for being part of this important conversation and let us embark on this journey for exploration and discovery. It is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker this forum today, Professor Ochide Ibe, who will provide valuable insight into the intricate relationship between climate change and the global energy landscape. Thank you and let us begin a journey towards a more sustainable and harmonious future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless Nigeria. Thank you. Is that was the fitting of the 12th, the chairman of the 12th Legacy Lecture Series. Let's celebrate him. Thank you so much. New Cross, we are glad you are part of this event. Of course, he's also a sponsor. Please, can we give him a sponsor's applause, please? Your Excellency's very distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, for the next 15 minutes, we will be learning from the reason why we are here. I would say the peak of today's event. I'm going to quickly read the profile of a keynote speaker i believe it's going to be on the screen and for those online i believe you would be seeing it profile of keynote speaker with academic and professional qualifications in geology engineering chemistry and oceanography including a phd and dic from the royal school of mines imperial college of school of science and technology united kingdom london uk Professor A. Chidi Ibe is a retired United Nations technocrat, diplomat with service spanning over 20 years in UNEP, UNESCO, UNIDO, from 1989 to 2008. Please let's celebrate him. He's outside here. For the last two decades of UN service, 2006 to 2008, he held concurrent appointment as Regional Director and Executive Secretary Interim Guinea Current Commission in UNIDO. His areas of expertise and experience include oceans, blue economy, energy and environment, natural resource management, sustainable industrial development, education. He's a long-time university teacher. He has been a pro-chancellor and the chairman of the governing council, Imo State University, from the year 2008 to 2011. Of course, the chairman visitation panel to federal universities in the year 2001. And he still holds a professorship to a number of universities, including the Emerald Energy Institute, Uniport, Postgraduate School, Nigerian Defense Academy, Kaduna, and Oil and Gas Institute, University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Professor Ibe is the author and co-author, editor, co-editor of 19 books and manuals. A round of applause, please. 15 books, chapters, and over 100 technical papers in reputable journals and referred conference proceedings. I like that. I like that. I like that. You're proud of you, sir. Of course, over 50 major consultancy reports for the United Nations systems, national government, and the private sector. The Library of the Institute of National Resources, Environment, and Sustainable Development Uniports. Of course, he 
is named a Chidi Ibe library to honor him. Wow, wow. He has been chairman, House of Reps, panel of experts on climate change policy and legislation from 2010 to 2015. And of course, a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science and the New York USA Academic of Science. Professor Ibe was appointed an NUC Distinguished Scholar in Diaspora in April 2011. He is the chairman of the Non-For-Profit Sustainable Energy Association Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, we are welcome. Please let's give a round of applause as we listen to a pest setter, a jinx breaker, an industry icon, a man of wonders. Please a resounding round of applause for Professor Chidi Ibe, Professor of Oceanography and the Blue Economy, an industry expert in energy, environment, and climate change. Sir, the stage is yours. Keep clapping till he gets the mic from me, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased that our paths uh, have crossed again. Um, I'm very delighted and honored to be here today. Um, I would like to salute the um, ninth vice chancellor of the university despite all the um, commitments you have added to the routine engagements that the vc normally should have we made it a point to be here today i thank you for this singular honor uh, mr vc so when is Oh, is there? Okay, I'll, I'll look in this way. I wish to, um, after the VC, recognize uh, the chairman of this occasion. Uh, you've had him speak. And um, we, as the audience, we feel um, highly honored to come all the way to chair the meeting. Uh, you also have a hand as the sponsor for this occasion. So we salute you. Um, after the chairman for the occasion, I have somebody who is my perpetual chairman, my wife, the delectable Chima Ibe, chief lady. So, permanent chairman, as uh, most of you would know. Um, I wish to salute two individuals. I have a bit of a uh, story there. I knew um, Professor Eboga. When the VC says somebody is a professor, you don't argue. Because that's what he's there for, chief academic officer. So, but affectionately, everybody called him Dr. E, and still uh, do. Um, I met him on a wintry uh, December day in 1977. That looks like, um, sounds like Middle Ages. Um, he had arrived that in the Royal School of Mines, Imperial College, um, before me. And um, of course, um, recognizing some bit of hierarchy, even among uh, the students, I had to go seek him out. And he struck me as somebody special. And it is redundant to say that he proved that correct through his exploits around the world and by the things he did, by the flames he lit in several places. Those flames are still burning. And in our little corner in Nigeria, two people have been outstanding 
in terms of their commitment to keep the flame burning. So and I wish to recognize the indomitable, and I mean indomitable, Emeritus Professor Wumi Iladere. Please take a bow. And the second person I wish to recognize in a special way is of course somebody most of you are familiar with, our seventh um, vice chancellor of this university who did a lot in terms of transformational leadership. So I wish to recognize and salute the indefatigable eminent Professor Joseph Ajenka. In Parliament, they say, take a bow and go. This one, you take a bow and sit with us. So the honor continues. And I wish to recognize in a particular way, you know, his wife, when I arrived here, um, hosted me and that stuck. You know, I kept going back to their place and um, I called him the first lady. I mean, I called her the first lady and that name has stuck ever since. Everybody knows her as the first lady. First lady, please. Doctor, Doctor Mrs. Rajenka. And of course I have my former boss seated there, Professor Hart. Please give away. <clears throat> now, by some um, accident of history, colonial, British colonial history, I was, um, I was born Christian and Protestant. As soon as I was discerning enough, coincidentally, I have my personal physician, Professor Okonta, Kelechi Okonta, give away. And my dentist there, <laughs> so, so many heavy weights, you pardon me. Um, the Honorable Commissioner came personally to honor me with his presence. Uh, I wish to salute him. Uh, that's what friendship is all about. Um, so back to my story of being born um, Christian and Protestant. As soon as I was discerning enough, I asked my dad, what is this thing about Protestant? I know about the Roman Catholics. That's what we call them those days. Uh, he said, well, it's about those who protested against the Roman Catholics. I said, I said, really? He said, yes. And I said, did they get anything out of the protest? He said, yes, they have their own church. And I think that stayed with me. And since then, I've never given up any occasion to protest. I mean, if, if guys protested and got their own church, come on, it's what, um, you know, I join any protest. And sometimes even at the university, I will join a protest. And after we've been dispersed, I said, what was it for? That, that's how serious I take protesting. So when the program was sent to me two days ago, I saw that um, contrary to my expectation, I had been allotted 35 minutes uh, of a keynote speech. Instinctive, I didn't have to think about it. Now, my friends run this show, but I didn't. This protest doesn't know friends or enemy. It's just instinctive. So I protested. I said, no, I, I, I was looking forward to an hour. Usually keynote addresses, you know, last typically 45 to one hour, preferably one hour. And like I asked my dad, and he said they, they, they against their own church, they gave me 50 minutes. It's the equivalent of getting my own church, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Chairman, uh, I told you this, this, you know, this reflexive attitude to protesting knows no boundaries. So I recognize that you're chairman but I need my 50 minutes. And if it doesn't happen, I'm going to protest. 
So if I were you, Mr. Chairman, please don't go there. Just let me go. I'll try and remain within the um, 15 minutes uh, allotted to my uh, speech. So let's go. Now, there's very little doubt that um, a globe as the Earth has been warming. And this has been more patent since the uh, industrial era, which began in the 18th uh, century. And it's gotten worse over the last few decades uh, because each succeeding decade has been warmer than the previous one. This year, 2023, has recorded high temperatures in very obscure places. That tells you that the trend is continuing. And so many other things are happening. Sea surface temperatures rising, sea ice decreasing. These are typical manifestations of a warming glory. Furthermore, it's not just that the globe is warming. Uh, it has become evident that humans breed anthropogenic activity largely in the continued emission of the so-called greenhouse gases have been responsible for this continued rise. Now, among the greenhouse gases, um, emissions from fossil fuels have been fingered as the main culprits uh, driving this uh, warming trend. And this is it. Um, I like when young people talk to each other. I, I hear them say, trust me. I'm not asking you to trust me. Come with me, look at the statistics. And you will see that dominantly in this pie graph that you have about 80% uh, contribution from, um, from fossil fuels. And you can see renewable energy immediately 10% is rising, nuclear energy, 9%. Now, the changing patterns in climate, known as climate change, wrought by this warming trend, have caused multifaceted impacts on our natural environment, inducing extreme weather events. And they include the accelerating sea level rise, it's influencing water, Accessibility is intensifying wildfires, provoking human displacement, and of course the conflicts that come with those displacements, and even impacting our travel and committing uh, trends or patterns, etc. Now, in 2009, uh, then President Barack Obama, before the Copenhagen Climate Conference, called climate change the greatest, quote, the greatest challenge of our times. That's how seriously the world takes the uh, issue of climate change. Of course, we know that the infamous climate date derailed the ambitions of world leaders um, to sign a binding climate agreement in Copenhagen uh, to rein in greenhouse gases. This was to happen uh, six years after in, um, in Paris or well, the first attempt was in Copenhagen, Denmark. Now, internationally, the climate negotiations rolled on and propelled by doomsday scenarios um, painted in the several uh, IPCC reports. The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, And of course, the, the, the voice of protests or urgence of the environmental action groups, um, climate change was elevated. For good reasons, it was argued to an existential threat. Fossil fuels, which had been fingered as the main culprits, um, slowly but surely became, quote, marked for extermination. It was in these circumstances that the world leaders met um, in um, Paris in December 
2015 and backed by the famous or infamous national determined uh, contribution document signed the landmark Paris Climate Agreement, the PCA. Today, Mr. Chairman, climate change is driving policy shifts, um, reshaping industrial and commercial activities, and indeed paving the way for novel opportunities and challenges in the spheres of energy development and agribusiness with the promise of a more conducive and sustainable world. Now, the most glaring of these adjustments which the world is called upon to make are encapsulated in the much vaunted energy transition. That's what we we're talking about today. And the almost single-minded pursuit of achieving net zero, call it carbon neutral, others call it climate neutral by 2050. Recall the IPCC had concluded in assessment report number four issued in 2007, uh, the need for net zero CO2 by 2050 in order to remain consistent with a 1.5 degree uh, centigrade rise above pre-industrial temperatures. But is this whole pillar blue about energy transition, is it something new, really? Because since humanity came into its own through the discovery of the first source of energy fire, there has been an energy transition. Again, I'm not asking you to trust me. Come with me where they have viable statistics and look at the shares of US energy consumption by major energy sources between the independence 1776 and 2015, and the current one issued in uh, April 2022 is not much different. So we we'll use this one. And you'll find that transition, which is still ongoing in a sense, or in every sense, from wood to coal, to petroleum, they say petroleum, but that's actually crude oil, to natural gas, which is associated with the crude oil, uh, to nuclear energy, to hydroelectricity, to other renewables. So there has been, you know, an energy transition since humanity came to its own. Now, this particular energy uh, transition was more due to preference. And that preference was predicated on the ease of combustibility of the fuel and the ease of production, transportation, handling, and use conditions. Of course, if something is convenient, you go for it. Now, let's look at the lessons from the um, ongoing um, transition which we inherited. The first one is that in the move from one dominant fuel to the other, the fuel that is substituted does not go away. I repeat that. In the transition from one fuel to the other, the fuel that is subst substituted does not just go away. It fades gradually as the replacing fuel or substituting fuel in the energy mix comes, you know, uh, into its own. Two, taking lessons from the coal to petroleum transition, it takes 50 to 60 years, it could be more for this to happen. And as prices fall, certain lessons are pertinent. One, that only few producers that adopt best practices escape the ensuing destabilization. Two, that cheaper production costs keep one fuel competitive over the other. Three, that diversification of the industry is a safety belt to any upheavals within the larger industry for fuels. 
about decarbonization, which you've heard so much about, tied to the uh, uh, future energy transition, which we've been headed towards. Now, in this first energy transition, despite what was known about pollution, including its impacts on humans and the environment, decarbonization as we know it was a distant consideration, if at all. I repeat, decarbonization in the present energy transition was a distant consideration, if at all. The purveyors of uh, fossil fuels and the governments supporting them were content literally in mining gold. And they smiled and drank all the way to the bank, singing money, money, money. You know that old song. They couldn't be bothered that, you know, uh, the pollution was a collateral. So you will ask naturally, so what changed? You know, in a Saleco in Lagos, they'll say, can it happen? What really happened? When and how did the need to decarbonize become an existential issue, then a stampede towards a net zero emissions world, largely without fossil fuels by 2050? To answer the question or to ponder the issue, let's take lessons from COP26 in Glasgow. This was hyped a whole lot hosted by the UK government and was the first real um, review since Paris 2015. The treaty had five year mark for the first review. How did fossil fuels and other issues fare? Take coal, for instance. Um, everybody thought, also the high, made us think that coal will receive a death sentence in Glasgow, that India, Australia, China, the big boys of coal use, watered down pre-conference doomsday scenarios in regard to coal. So what we ended up with out of Glasgow was a tepid statement about tamping down the use of coal. How about petroleum, the, the big boy of fossil fuels? Pressure from petroleum producing giants, Saudi Arabia, UAE, et cetera, the USA, backed by the big international companies, the IOCs, resulted in a wishy-washy statement about stopping unwarranted subsidies on oil and gas. In, which, in plain words, nothing happened really. The needle didn't shift. How about agriculture, which we know is responsible for 24% of the um, of the global burden. Look at the global greenhouse gas emissions by uh, economic sector. And you find here, does this work, the pointer? It should work there, here, in orange, that agriculture contributes a whopping 24%. Was anything said, anything tangible said about agriculture? and this contribution in uh, Glasgow? No. Why? The big boys of agriculture, which are industrialized countries who own commercial agriculture and who regard this as a lifeline, blocked any attempt to really discuss this contribution. And how about the CCUS, which is carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which are a suite of technologies that can help reduce the pressure on fossil fuels and achieve net zero emissions. In fact, this suite of technologies is touted to be the key, the answer, at least in the last uh, few years, the answer to arriving at net zero uh, quickly, at least by the target, or even before then. But what happened? There was no little appetite to explore these in Glasgow. 
check two examples of the um, carbon capture and utilization storage. One comes out of my old place in Imperial College, uh, London, that have established a new platform which could boost, I mean, boost the uh, development of carbon capturing barrels. Now, it sounds light, but that's huge in terms of quantitative impacts. Take the next one, that you could achieve more efficiency in coal and natural gas power generations using this new technique. Phenomenal uh, uh, savings in terms of um, uh, uh, squelching the release of carbon dioxide. Now, th there is more to do in the area of carbon capture and sequestration, including the direct air capture. This morning, as I woke up at about 5.30, um, I was reading, just announced yesterday, a new uh, technology that joins nuclear reactors with um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide emitting uh, technologies in order to squelch the CO2 emission. So commenting on this advance, uh, Nenad Milovic, a professor of mechanical science and engineering at the University of Illinois at Urban-Champaign in the US, and who is the project lead, said, and I quote, the reality is that fossil fuels are not going away for at least a hundred years. Excuse me, these guys would know. Um, Emeritus Professor Ladder, you know that, that fossil fuels are going nowhere for the next hundred years. Don't mind the hype, don't mind the hula balloon, but this accords with the realities we know. He said, and I quote, a lot of CO2 is going to be emitted before we get to a place where we can lean on renewables. Mark you, the renewables are supposed to substitute and it's gonna be a long ride. Now, let's leave the thematic areas and examine the conduct of our co-travelers along the path to energy, um, uh, transition. Take Germany, for instance. Germany, which had been the apostle of green energy, established, opened a spanking new coal station in 2019. And when they were from the environmental bodies, they apologized and said, oh, we're going to stop with, um, you know, by sponsoring or funding from green air projects. This is 2019 after they had signed to kill coal. I mean, and uh, other fossil fuels in 2015. Take Norway. Norway gets energy almost 100% from power, but they are the greatest export in Europe of fossil fuels. And they're earning phenomenal amounts of money from this process. Uh, you need to check their sovereign wealth fund to recognize what I'm telling you. They're mining, not just gold, they're mining platinum and diamond from selling fossil fuel. And they've shown no appetite to stop. Look at the USA, fresh from Glasgow um, and claiming court order, um, they opened bid rounds for new acreages for petroleum exploration. And of course, th those were quickly snapped up by their big boys, Exxon Mobil and uh, Chevron. And now there are noises that there'll be new bids in the Gulf of Mexico. The one in Alaska, Biden had blocked, which was, but the show goes on, you know, as it were. Look at the UK. The, the, the issue of UK is a little galling when you think about it, for those of us immersed in this politics. UK is delaying, after all the boast during Glasgow uh, 2021, which they hosted, they boasted that uh, the UK will be the um, Saudi Arabia of wind power. They boasted that they were going to stop uh, internal combustion engines by the beginning of the next decade, 2030. All sort of things were on the table, very enticing. But today, 
UK is delaying closures of their coal plants. UK is delaying closures of their nuclear plants. What's still, only in November last year, Richie Sooner, reacting to the energy demands, uh, uh, approved the establishment of a brand new coal mine in Cumbria Wells, uh, which will be operational in a few years. So they're looking into the future. They're seeing something and telling us something else. Now, EU and the um, Russia-Ukraine war, all of you are familiar. Well, what? How the European Union um, countries panicked after the start of this war. First with energy penury, they switched back to abandoned sources of energy, like coal, um, like diesel plants, like nuclear plants, et cetera, just to escape the stranglehold of Russia and its uh, geopolitical uh, implications. Now, I can hear you from the audience from here. I can hear you gasping, saying, what? Now I have the lecture, you know, preparing this was gasping under my breath, what? So, was the world no longer in peril from the continued use of these dirty and risky fuels? Why suddenly did they seem to abandon the rest of the world to a catastrophic future that they themselves had so elaborately, uh, elaborately painted? Now, most of you who listen to CNN will be familiar with John Day Terrors. He's the bureau chief for the Middle East and deals mostly with analysis of the uh, energy and petroleum uh, situation as they evolve. He took a detailed view in a series of uh, broadcasts and came to the conclusion after looking at the, you know, scene, some of which I've just described. He came to the conclusion that clean energy is not a done deal by any means. Because amid the billions promised for green ventures out of the various COP meetings, China and the US may have other plans. Now, you would like to ask, how about Russia? We just heard about Russia and the EU. What is the name of this game? Geopolitics, self-preservation, self-interest. Give it to them that self-preservation is the first law of nature. So when, when the push comes to show, they go back to what is convenient for them. Take these two, you know, in the blue corner, you have the US in the red corner, of course, you have the, um, um, <laughs> you have the USA. And they're that fact because they feed in fact out of the geopolitical considerations. Now, there is a jostling for supremacy between these two. And you only need to listen to radio and television to be aware of this. And if you, even if you didn't listen, you, you, you can feel that if you're close to uh, uh, international affairs. Every indication is that their struggle for supremacy will get in the way of orderly transition as presently envisaged. After finally shaking up 40 years of dependence on Middle Eastern uh, oil, there is no way I live there. I still, you know, have presence there. That the USA is going to give in to any arrangements um, that will give China any control over their energy security and, by implication, their economic lifeline. Here is one. China dominates the production of lithium. Incidentally. Uh, Two days ago, the USA announced that accidentally they bumped into the largest lithium reserves in the world just two days ago. Now, you know the, the first man that said seeing is believing is Nigerian? Okay, 
you need to go back to Encyclopedia Britannica to see that. <laughs> um, we need to see that presently, lithium production is dominated by China, Bolivia, you know, Australia, and just four other countries. And the rare earths, which underpin the manufacture of most uh, renewable technologies, are controlled by China. From wind turbines to solar panels to battery electric cars, where China is leading the global development. Never mind all the shenanigans of Musk and his uh, 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 cohorts. China is leading and even exporting complete sets of technologies to the European Union. The USA is whining about this every day, um, but, but they're winning this battle. China also dominates the supply market for renewables. The USA will not trade away the dominance and security that Shell, oil, and gas have given them to enable her leapfrog Saudi Arabia as the number one producer of petroleum in the world to, you know, for some new romance uh, in um, global strategies and targets embodied in the uh, Paris Climate Agreement anchored on dodgy international solidarity. No, not the USA, no, not the one you know. It has happened before. Recall that the USA, after leading the world towards uh, adoption of the Kyoto Protocol, George Bush came to power and said, we're not signing this. And they said, why? He said, it gives undue advantage to our geopolitical competitors. Developing countries all the same, but our competitors, China, Brazil, um, India in particular. Recall again that after championing the Paris Climate Agreement, Obama was, you know, uh, hands and feet into that. The USA under President Trump, just a change in government, they flipped and left everybody in the cold. And it was fortuitous that Biden came to power in um, 20, beginning 2021 and restored USA adhesion. So he said something about geopolitical uh, 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 politics. I mean, ge ge geopolitical wranglings and um, jostling for supremacy. Is all this ju juggling a surprise? No. I'm sure if I, if I put that to vote, I will hear a massive uh, no. Because the first trigger to the world of renewables, real trigger, um, an alternative energy was tipped in geopolitics, which played out exactly half a century ago. In fact, just one month to half a century ago, that was 1973. The UK Minister for Energy, Security and Net Zero Graham Stuart was just recalling this history on 5th of September, yesterday, literally, last week, Tuesday, um, as he opened the 50th anniversary meeting of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Offshore Europe in the UK. And the jostling has remained ever after, epitomized by the G20, G. 77, sometimes G77 plus China, the battles that played out on the shop floor as several conference of parties uh, under the UNFCCC rolled on. As a diplomat and technocrat in the United Nations system for 20 years across three strategic organizations, UNEP, uh, UNESCO, and UNIDO, I had a front row seat and sometimes was thrown into the rain, forced into the rain, as these battles for supremacy and dominance and advantages played out. Now, an unusual event, it, oh, this happened in error. When I looked at it, I said, but I'm talking about unusual events. So if this slide is bent, it tells you a story about an unusual event. And that unusual event, happened on Yom Kippur Day, 6th October, which was Israel's um, 
holiest day, a do nothing day, the Egyptian army and other armies surprised them and they were heading um, towards uh, Tel Aviv, singing victory songs when Israeli, um, Israel's um, Western allies intervened. And after dilly-dallying on October 14, 1973, the US started arms delivery. Uh, UK and the rest gave them satellite imagery that enabled them to cut off the Egyptian army and almost decimated them before a ceasefire was called on the 25th of October. The Arab countries who were the trading partners of the West were shocked by this about uh, face on the part of those they, thought they trusted as their allies. The Arab countries cried foul, even treachery. Okay, hey, you press the wrong one now. Okay, I got it. What happened? They instituted an oil boycott of the West, dominantly the US. But the West, Netherlands, Britain, you know, Germany, they cut off their oil. They said, keep your money. For this treasury, we're not going to trust you. We're not going to trade with you. And everywhere you looked in the industrial world, you saw lines of queues, you saw chaos that mimicked the situation where you have fuel scarcity in Nigerian cities. In the US, of course, when there's chaos, guns come out and a lot of people were killed. You were living there, sir. You know that story. Oh, wait a minute, 73. Uh-uh. Uh. Sorry, sir, you, you hadn't gotten there. Um, <laughs> this was 73. My eyes were wide awake then. Um, by the time this boycott ended, it lasted a shot that shot in human history. But very long, if you think that the West was industrialized nations were totally dependent on petroleum as their energy source. By the time it ended, incidentally, it wasn't OPEC. I read from history, it's OPEC. It was the organization of <clears throat> Arab Petroleum Exporting Company, which was a precursor to OPEC. Um, but by the time the boycott was called off at this meeting, where is my pointer? You can see um, Sheikh Yamani in the middle there. He dominated the world of uh, energy and petroleum politics for a long while. By the time they called off the boycott of the West, oil had gone up from a niggardly $2.5 per barrel to $12.5 uh, per barrel threatening to bring the conveyor belt of production in the industrialized world to a screeching halt. Excuse me, things will never be the same again. I repeat, Mr. Chairman, after this, things will never be the same again in the world. And you can see that spike in 73, although a low came, but the spike went up again. It changed the whole oil dynamics. Now, just as a digression, Gaddafi of Libya took a front, uh, <laughs> front line stance in all these dynamics playing out. And the West never forgave him. And at the, they trailed him and at the uh, 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 fastest opportunity, they got rid of him. It took to 2011 to get rid of him, but he was marked from 73, um, but that's an aside. Back to the uh, uh, oil politics. The 1973 oil shock knocked the wind out of the global economy. It trailed into the 70s and helped trigger a stock market uh, crash, soaring inflation and high unemployment, ultimately leading to the fall of a UK government. The Edward Heath government fell and it was succeeded by Labour, Labour's uh, Harold Wilson. Boy.
In the USA, the 1973 oil price shock with the accompanying 1973 to uh, 74 stock market crash was regarded as the first discrete event since the Great Depression to have a persistent effect on the US economy. Now, unlike here in these climes, when something really, really drastic goes wrong, the minister then tells you, or those responsible tell you, by the special grace of God, it won't happen. No, it doesn't, they don't work that way out here. In response to the high oil prices of the 70s, industrial nations took steps to reduce their dependence on OPEC oil. Electric utilities worldwide switched from oil to coal to natural gas or whatever. Commercial exploration was initiated in areas that were hitherto thought to be precinct in Liberia, I mean, Siberia, Alaska, North Sea, and Gulf of Mexico. This was a new jack reaction by industrial countries to stabilize their individual and collective economies to the shock of the boycott and the high prices that, uh, that engendered. But projecting into the future, that's what sensible people do when they suffer such uh, unexpected shocks. The industrial nations were determined, one, that never again, and I say never again, would circumstances outside their control threaten their energy security and by corollary their economies. Two, conscious of the ballooning oil prices and the lack of the resource, petroleum, in their own backyards, they were to devote their attention to renewable and alternative energies as a lasting or, if you will, permanent solution. Now, again, putting their money where their mouths are, they poured billions of dollars. Check the history. They poured billions of dollars into the quest for functional renewable energy technologies. The reliance on petroleum as principal energy source had caused them pain and embarrassment in the past. They were not in a hurry to forget or, did I hear forgive? Yeah, I agree. I didn't say it, but I agree. They had very little to lose um, in letting go of petroleum. They had everything to gain in that shift to free and limitless sources. Of course, there's technology to pay for, but did significantly from what resulted in Paris, the die was cast for fossil fuels. Now, the cheap oil of the 1980s distracted them a little bit, <clears throat> but as oil prices picked up again into the 2000s, industrialized nations lamented the high cost of oil to their industrial production costs. By some twist of fate, new and substantial petroleum were confined to, um, were being discovered in perilous and house, uh, places outside of their control, at least the overt control. Now, the industrialized countries worrying that 1973 could happen again, thank you so much. You were the reason I came to Uniport and you're still and you're still looking after me. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So the industrialized, the industrial countries worried that 73, you know, brought back the focus on consolidating renewable energy technologies and snuffing out fossil fuels and made very stunning progress. Remember what, of all his faults, remember what um, um, uh, Trump did in the case of COVID. You know, usually these uh, vaccines take 10, 15 years minimum to go through the cycle. He engineered their operation fast speed and they did it in less than one year. They did a similar thing. <clears throat> they knew all the possibilities were there. 
But as long as things were going well, but when the crunch came, they put their development of renewable energy technologies on a fast track and made stunning progress. They milked this progress. Now, armed with their resolve and confident of the progress in substituting conventional uh, with renewable energies, um, they turned their attention again to the kill fossil fuels uh, message. It looked from the outside a happy coincidence of climate science and technological prowess. But believe me, or you can read the history, the truth is that it had a large dose of hard nosed deliberation and pla planning on their part. Again, I had a front seat as these uh, developments happened. Now, while the industrialized countries negotiated during the successive Conference of Parties. Uh, did you hear that I'm a Protestant? No, I, I put my 15 minutes in the hands, not of the MC, but of the chairman. Okay, sir, so enough of this distraction now. Um, so, as they negotiated at the Conference of Parties, they were conscious of 1973 and the pains and the embarrassment fossil fuels caused them. In contrast, most people on the delegations of developing countries, the G77, especially African countries, came to these meetings with a naive notion of a charitable world where everyone was his brother's keeper. And most times they were sleeping or shopping in the streets of New York while the meetings were going on. And they had one man delegations, you know, coming to discuss climate change. The man must have read something else, you know. And you look at the US delegation, Germany, um, UK, they have 30 man delegation. Each subset in terms of specialization, the role will play, new set of people will come in, fresh brains, fresh minds, concentration. They took it serious business. So they didn't know. So apart from the naive worldview, it was impossible for many countries of the G77 to send experts to these meetings, as many simply had no expertise or money. Their negotiators often did not know if what was put to them was a fair compromise or a concession, which they were being invaded into making. Furthermore, it did not help that at this time, the G77 was somewhat fragmented. 2009, for the first time, the uh, industrialized countries put money on the table. They know how to, you know, engender the divide and rule uh, uh, policy. And once money is put on the table, even before it is seen, while it is still earmarked, the developed countries begin to scramble. You can see their eyes light up if you're in the museum with them. And some start dreaming of skyscrapers they'll build in their home, home countries. So they use this to divide the thing. So, so the last, but back to the present. The global energy transition as presently conceived would mean that the world has to win itself of dependency on fossil fuels that presently make up about 80% of the energy mix and ditch plans to either um, uh, keep them in the, in the, in the ground, you know, um, or not even express, explore at all. The problem is fossil fuel is behind everything we do. And much of the things we use in our daily lives, from furniture to fertilizers, from toothbrush to lipstick. Did you imagine that lipstick? To medicines in your medicine cabinet contain one form of hydrocarbon or the other. So it's going nowhere. Remember the guy talking about 100 years? It's going nowhere. Even the renewable energy technologies depend on fossil fuels for their fabrication. You, you, you cut your nose to spite your face. 
petroleum underpins our modern transportation. A lot of services will grind to a halt without it. And you take transportation, whereas you can talk about electric rails, electric cars, but look at aviation. There is still no substitute for aviation fuel. What they call the sustainable aviation fuel has only 0 0.10 to 0.15% of the market share. Literally still on the tarmac are waiting to take off. For container ships responsible for global trade, there is still no substitute. Look at this hype about hydrogen and the rest. The practical issues are detrimental to the success of uh, those enterprises. Um, they are the ones, the fossil fuels power them across the world in, in the form of bunker fuel. It's little wonder that all the projections, whether by governments, whether by individual think tanks, whether by the oil companies themselves, whether by the renewable energy companies, show that though the energy landscape is changing, oil and gas and coal will continue to be relevant beyond 2050. Besides, I just told you about almost everything is made from crude oil. You might think this is wood. Believe me, this is hydrocarbon. Almost everything. And so petroleum is fit stock for the industry. Now, I say, come with me, let's go, you know, into this make-believe world of um, clean, uh, renewable, and alternative energy, flowing metaphorically with um, uh, milk and honey. And I can tell you, because I've surveyed this landscape, that is not a straw in the park. Far from it. Already in the U.S., the electric car inventory has been piling up on dealership lots this year. As companies uh, up their electric vehicle production, uh, gingered by the uh, subsidies provided under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act of the Biden. This was reported in the Insider Magazine of July. So it's not just that this vehicles are expensive, said their spokesman, which they are. We are talking about a much more nuanced lifestyle change, including charging and range anxiety as impediments for many buyers. It's hard for the average customer to make that leap while spending an extra 10,000 or more, said uh, Fiorani of the Car Dealers Association. So after all the hype, after all the glamour, after all the uh, razzmatazz, the electric market has, uh, car market has bombed. And then you take the bigger picture. The two most promising renewable energy sources are plagued by intermittency problems. And then um, there are questions of uh, integration into the power grid, et cetera. The EU, to tell you what the cost element is, the EU has budgeted 2 trillion euros to deal with the issues. Now, for Africa, show me the money. Most are overboard and have no capacity to attract any funds. I understand the ADB has published just last week in Nairobi during the meeting of African heads of state new strategies to overcome this handicap. Okay, so there are sort of problems and I'm going to go very quickly. So let's ask ourselves, are we seeing the handwriting on the wall? I'm seeing, I don't know about you. Um, but if you look hard enough, Shell PC's um, new boss, Wild Sawan, said recently, I am of the firm view that the world will need oil and gas for a long time 
to come. As such, cutting oil and gas production is not healthy. This was on the 3rd of March, 2023. Yesterday, literally. BP, PLC, Shell's closest peer had a similar uh, uh, assertion that oil and gas, they're not cutting back on oil and gas investments. And when they were asked about the divestments, he said, we're talking about margins, not volumes. Exxon Mobil, the same. So there's the handwriting on the wall. If you read, this was the end of August, my world oil edition, USA shale reinvestment surge at fastest rate in three years. To 72%, that's phenomenal. Elsewhere, the scramble for new petroleum acreages in cascading bid rounds around the world speak of the resurgence of the petroleum industry rather than its demise. So we need to sit up. And if you look at the 2021 figures, you find that of all the hula balloon around renewables and clean energy, that is just a niggardly 12%. It's inching up now. It went up a little last year, uh, but it's still a far cry. Now, remember this guy who talked about the 100 years? You need to listen to him now. Here, Graham Stott, the UK Minister for uh, Energy and uh, Net Zero. He says, even when the UK has reached net zero in 2050, this was last Tuesday, September 5, as it is legally obligated to do his words, it's estimated that around a quarter of the country's energy needs will still come from oil and gas. Is anybody listening? Okay, come with me again. Here, Minister Stuart again, he said that officials in the UK government have failed to tell the people the story of dependence on oil and gas um, and efforts to decarbonize oil and gas. Nor has anyone discussed the fact that the energy industry is one industry. That's why when, um, Professor Ladera arrived here. He separated them, but kept them together, energy and petroleum economics. It makes sense because it's all industry. It doesn't need to be, he said, it's in quotes, it doesn't need to be divided into sheep or goats. I don't like sheep or goats. I prefer Pisces, I mean, uh, uh, fish. Uh, my zodiac sign is Pisces. But his words, it doesn't have to be divided into sheep or goats emphasized SWAT, quote, it isn't divided between the blessed and the damned, the green and the filthy oil and gas. It is one industry, okay? Now, you remember Fela in his song, Lady? He said, I never tell you finish. I never tell you finish. Let's go back to SWAT, referring to the potential to exploit new and emerging technologies such as hydrogen production, carbon capture usage and storage, offshore uh, wind. Stuart said, noted that it is traditional oil and gas companies that are going to deliver these projects. Excuse me, are you listening? It is traditional oil and gas companies that are going to deliver these projects. And you should know, it is in fact, in quote, the oil and gas industry's expertise, their balance sheets, their engineering, their subsea capabilities uh, that makes net zero possible, said Stuart accurately. And my question is, or my reaction, really? Why then are we being told to ditch this petroleum under our belt? Because it is damned and filthy, and to leap into the other world because it is clean and safe without anyone showing us any credible path to achieving this El Dorado? Who will drive the adoption of renewable uh, technologies, as you've just heard, for us if we prematurely snuff out our petroleum industry? Is it going to be another leap in the dark that we are being asked to take, spurred by the subtle threat that if we don't jump willingly, we might be pushed, 
Is it time to dare the status quo and to ask relevant questions? I'm, I'm coming to the end, Mr. Chairman. Once you start asking questions, we're happening towards the end. Have no doubt that energy plays a critical role in driving economic growth. Thus, energy transition must not compromise energy supply reliability. So what we have in hope it's like you're hungry, really starving. You have meat pie in your hand, and somebody says, drop it. This is nothing. Look up in the sky. There is jollof rice coming. You're going to drop it, sir? Ma? No, I don't think so. I wouldn't. Uh, I will hold on to that one, put it in the armpit, and scrape my hand to catch the jollof rice. Now, try the beloved continent. That's why I was sorry for African uh, leaders when they gathered in Nairobi last uh, week, uh, ostensibly to chart a new path. But in the preambular part of their declaration, I saw that paragraph five, climate change is the greatest single most important issue confronting humanity. And I said, really? They had been cute to sing somebody else's song. Where do they place institutional poverty, hunger, disease, unending conflicts linked to uh, gross underdevelopment, engineered by global geopolitics to pin the continent down? Those of you who are old enough will remember one song, far, 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 far. It's a sad song. That's what your leaders were singing. Time to call a spade a spade. Is it time, I think I have three slides, yeah. time, is it time for serious reflection based on the journey that we have undertaken, based on the continued evidence of the continued viability of petroleum and the evident flip-flops of our co-travelers in the global energy transition journey? Is there a necessity for developing countries and particularly African countries and oasis does the island states to pause and reflect on ways to navigate the energy trilemma of energy security, energy affordability, and energy sustainability. If I didn't mention this, uh, women will kill me. Um, but that's the energy trilemma without necessarily being victims of a herd mentality and strapped to the much vaunted single track global energy transition model. The danger of being left in a lurch is real. There is nothing immutable in a treaty. Amendments are more of the norm than the exception. So I wanted to take you into history, but I don't have that time. So I'm going to jump. I talked about pie in the sky, talked about dematerialization, and you can read this in the full uh, uh, rendering of this. Remember the pig theory? And then now we'll talk about the petroleum, uh, petroleumization. Don't look for that in the dictionary, it's my coinage. And my answer is no chance. Too big to fail or to vanish. That's the reality of petroleum. Now the Paris summit, uh, 23rd of June, they've come up with new stories about carbon pricing, about uh, um, long-term affordable financing. All that came to my mind when I read this, is, when I read this is beware of the Ides of March. Don't ask me what that means. I'm still trying to figure that out. Now, Nigeria with a developed petroleum industry can take the lead in changing the status quo and enlist the African Union uh, now that it's been um, granted G20 membership. You can test the waters and see what they think. But Nigeria must first navigate to a safe operating space. Nigeria must deliberately, aggressively, and impactfully reposition its petroleum industry, including a reasoned diversification of its value chains and rational pursuit of the national gas policy. Uh, this is the song Mumi has been singing since. Uh, since uh, the eminent uh, uh, Professor Joseph uh, Ajenka lured him back into the country. Um, 
but are they listening, sir? I hope they do. Um, so these are things that I've talked about endlessly on different platforms, and I'm not going to repeat. But one thing is critical in all these lists, you must build a refining capacity so that if you want to stick with your petroleum, no person will hold you to ransom. And I was teaching a course with me took me two, two weeks ago in Abuja, and they asked me, why is Dangote, um, why is Dangote building this when they're shutting down? I said, no, first, nobody is shutting down. Don't believe all they have. That Dangote is offering us a safety net that when the crunch comes and you want to tow that independent line, you have your refining capacity in place. And I said he was given a GCON, but if there's something greater than the GCFR, I think he should get that. But we need to solve, for goodness sake, the refining capacity issue. Is it a tall order? These things I listed, no, geez, no. Uh, just look at Singapore. It took it only 30 years to transition from third world to first world. All this abracadabra, the painting, has a 30 year lifespan to 2050, 2060. So you have time, you have space for maneuver. Malaysia, similar, but not exact history. And for goodness sake, look at Rwanda. They took UNDP took our governors to go and learn governance in Rwanda. Only yesterday, Rwanda was steeped in the aftermath of um, the genocide in the 90s. Today is the shining city on the hill. So it is doable. What Wumi has been advocating, what uh, the eminent professor Joseph Ajayika, what uh, didn't you know, irrepressible dosumo. Is he still there? Oh, oh okay. So you put a resource card. Be, be careful now. You're expanding the stakes. Oh, okay. So, what we have been espousing is, you know, that this thing is doable. Now, funds might be a problem because they said, oh, it's all contracted now, they're reserving everything out of Glasgow, one thirty trillion dollars for the energy industry in favor of renewable energies. And I'm saying there's a window of opportunity. Let's go to that before I come to last words. A, a window of opportunity exists in the form of private equity firms, um, which is estimated to have invested more than a trillion dollars in the energy industry since 2010, mostly in fossil fuels which underlies where the net zero financing battle is heading to. Next, I would say target those funds in private equity, and if need be, swoop on the sovereign wealth fund. It is created, that fund is created for more crunch times like this, when new directions of in national policy become imperative, and there are little options for help coming from elsewhere. Mr. Chairman, I'm glad I didn't have to protest, so I'm on my last slide. Uh, thank you very much for being accommodating. So I ask, is it time to review this one size fits all model of the global energy transition? Is it time to engineer or ask for a reset? Is it indeed, ladies and gentlemen, as good a time as any for Nigeria? as the big boy of African geopolitics, to galvanize the continent, to interrogate this global imposition of a monolithic strategy for a livable world, and in so doing, safeguard our collective future. So that, we'll ask this question, so that our children, most of you on the upper ranks, they are children, and your children, and their children, children, will be able to look back at such intervention as this in history with pride and say, that was our finest hour. I thank you very much, Doma Regato.
Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Speech. We've learned so much. Please, once again, can we give for eBay another round of applause? I understand that we have questions to ask. I understand. I understand that we have quite questions to ask. You would be given the opportunity to ask questions. But before then, we are supposed to have a five minutes music interlude. And if, okay. I, okay. They want to take group photos. So they'll take group photos and then a music interlude will go on for like five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Precious Omoku and Cherish Weglu as they will be giving us a five minutes or perhaps four minutes performance. Once we have our guests come back from taking photos, we continue with the panel session. Dr. Precious Omoku. In five minutes, we'd like to see have you back to your seats, please.
I pray you'll find our land and watch us where we go. And help us to be wise in times when we don't know. Let this be our friend when we lose our head. Lead us to a place, guide us with your grace, give us faith so we'll be saved. La lucha que tu da. In quarter as and hold it in our hearts. When stars go out each night, and turn us Nella mia preghiera, quanta fede che lead us to a place, guide us with your face on me. Sognamo un mondo senza violenza, un mondo di sostenibilità, un mondo di violenza. Kitchen, symbol Otra viar mo. En stella dentro que. Let this be open. Just like every child. Just like every child, we need to find a place. Guide us with your grace. Give us a soul we will be saved. Nella felicità. I have changed all you know. And you can't Thank you. We would like to request that if you see some seats in front of you, kindly come down, fill them up for photo optics, for good photo optics. We're switching gears immediately to the mini round table.
The mini round table is supposed to last for 30 minutes. So we kindly crave your indulgence that in about 30 minutes to 50 minutes, we will be out of this place. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to chair the panel, please help me welcome as he comes to the head table, the managing consultant, Wetcon Petroleum Limited, Professor Adewale Jusunu. would steer the entire session. And of course, I would also like to welcome Steel to join him, the Principal Consultant and CEO Reservoir and Facility Solutions Nigeria Limited Engineer, Mrs. Olusheyi Folabi, F-N-S-C-H-E. Steel joining them, Steel joining them, would be the keynote speaker, I want to believe he's back to his seat from Chidibe. Please kindly send a text to him if he's outside so that Prof Chidibe can join them on the head table. Or still joining them will be the executive director, Emmanuel Eboga Foundation, Professor Omi Ledare, who will join them on the, on the session. Professor Omi, please round of applause for him as he joins them. I want to confirm that the two participants that are supposed to join virtually, are they online? Okay. We well, like that the MD for Kenyon International he has been asked to respectfully join the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, engineer Victor Ekweyo, please join the sponsor for today's event. Come, panelists. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to hand over to the chair for the committee who would steer this discussion for the next 30 minutes. Sir. Okay. Please, can you come down, please, so that we can have good photo optics, please. Don't leave any space in front of you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this second session, which is the panel session, where we are going to look at aspects of our topic. The topic, of course, as you're aware, is uh, climate change and new policies of energy transition, which is one of the burning questions globally as of now. Prof has done an excellent job. Took us from the age of firewood to where we are today. And he raised a number of questions. And I think those questions are the ones that we need to answer at this panel session. And luckily for me, I have a repertoire of people on this panel who have, if you look at the combined experience here that I have across here, maybe you'll be talking about 200 to 250 years of experience. You look at it, what you have here. So what you are going to get are people who are going to bring their practical experience to bear on a topic that is very important. But let me say one thing. One thing is that in all these presentations, I don't know if you noticed, there was complete silence for Africa. There was complete silence for Nigeria. The, we, are, we contribute only 4% to issues of pollution globally in terms of CO2 emissions and all that. But we are likely to bear the brunt of more than 90% of what's likely to happen. So people sit at the table. And if you also noticed, in the recent past, China has been running to Africa. U.S. sending people to Africa. Coups have been taking place in Africa. They have to Cameroon to chase for uranium and other minerals that are there. I don't know if you can notice a trend. You know, sometimes my people say that when a witch cries in the night, and the baby dies in the morning. You don't need to look far to know who has killed the baby. So I believe that those who are here 
who know maybe to tell us who killed the bad baby. You'll be able to tell us. So we have that experience, and um, we're going to try to share. We have only about 30 minutes to be able to look at this. And I'm going to give them the latitude. Haven't listened to what they have done. Haven't had maybe an idea of what they want to present. To give us an idea on this particular issue. Climate change, we know, is there. You see a lot of global warming, flooding in China, flooding in Libya, flooding all over the place. The Bayesa Road being closed for two months and all that. We know it's there. Now, what role do we have to play? So I'm going to allow each of the people that are here, one, two, and I've got three. Uh, maybe they take like uh, five minutes, that's 15 minutes each, 15 minutes on the total. Then we go back for questions and then maybe we'll wrap up in the last five minutes. I don't know if that's good. We have an opinion, we have a consensus. We have an agreement on that. You know, when they say the A's have it, so the yes have it. So, um, and what they have told us is that we must respect ladies. You know, when you have a lady in the car, you are required to go around as a gentleman, open the door for her to come out of the car. So in this case, on this table, I have a lady, so I'm gonna ask her to take the first shot. So she, if you don't mind, please kickstart it. You've listened to the prof. Look at the topic and then let us know where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot say any more than the standing ovation that uh, Professor Ibe received after his uh, paper. It was such an excellent paper and it actually spoke out a lot of the things that I have been saying in the background as well. Um, oil, petroleum is politics. Politics is petroleum. It has been like that ever since um, we discovered oil. People went against Rockefeller, broke up his uh, industry into seven sisters. So we've known that this is an industry that has always had the eyes and ears of everyone because it affects us. And just like the prof was saying, petroleum products are all around us. There's nothing we can do. The capsules that you take, the wrappings, that plastic that contains the medication is petrochemical. And so from the beginning of time, when God actually decided that we should be able to discover this product, I would say that somewhere in Akure, when they first found it, they were using it to cure fleas on their dogs. So definitely petroleum product is a naturally occurring product and it's there for our use. Now, there is politics around it and everything that Professor Ibe said earlier on is actually what is going on. And my, my own perspective is Africa just always likes to be dragged in by the nose. You know, we do whatever the colonial masters ask us to do. When are we going to actually cut off the chains of slavery and do what we want to do? If you look at it, since 1956 that Nigeria first found oil in very large quantities in Africa and other countries like Libya and the rest of them, we've been finding more. There have been countries now that we never even thought would have oil and gas that have oil and gas now. Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, Namibia, and the majors are all in these countries. So what is it that they're saying with one side of their mouth and the other side of their mouth is doing something else? We got to decide. And I like the fact that you referred earlier on to the refineries. We've got to make our refineries work. Uh, personally, Port Harcourt is a dear and near city to me. I don't live here now, but I lived here first time in 1983 when I worked at the LMA uh, um, refinery. As a young engineer, uh, a pupil engineer, I was still in school, but I came for industrial training. Everyone that ran that refinery at the time were Nigerians. There were no experts there. I was there 
for six months with the turnaround maintenance by Nigerians for Nigeria. No one knew. We didn't have wealth scarcity. People didn't queue up there at the, at the gas stations. Then I came back and lived here for another five years. So it's a near and dear city to me. There's a lot that we could do with not bad mouthing what we have. Whatever we have, you know, we must use. Now, we also have solar power and we also have wind. Somehow we're so blessed. We have every type of energy. We can even have agricultural energy. People can grow acres and acres of corn and make methanol out of it. So Nigeria and Africa is blessed. And we just need to take our destiny in our own hands and begin to use it. What God has given us, let's use it for ourselves. We've got the population. We've got people in Africa that depend on Nigeria. We need to rise up and become the leader that really we are truly are. We must do what it takes to run our continent appropriately. And that's where I'll stop now until we get on to the next person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here this evening. Uh, Prof, God bless you. Uh, to be honest, I was carried away by your knowledge and your knowledge of history, economics, and everything. I pray for more long life for us to learn more. Uh, Prof, what really amazed me about the lecture is that you are thinking differently. And uh, based on studies and based on awareness, we have come to understand people at your age, uh, you know, after the silent generation, we had a baby boomers. People at your age and are not thinking the way you're thinking. People at your age are people that were brainwashed by our colonialists. Uh, people at your age, sorry, People like your age are people that travel to London to take, you know, Panadol. And whatsoever they want to do, they do it to please those that, you know, colonize us. And we now see the young generation coming up and now not seeing anything good in the continent, not seeing anything good in the country. And I'm so pleased today that you let us to know that there are people that are also thinking differently. So I want to talk about the awareness, uh, how we as young engineers, young entrepreneurs, young people that are coming up in Nigeria and in Africa as a continent can learn from your wealth of experience. For us to know that what we are seeing today the condition we're finding ourselves in this continent, in this country, sometimes may not just be a problem, may be a problem of geopolitics. And we have understood and we have read in history, we have seen that some coup and counter coup and change of governments have not deliberately been the desire of the people. It's just about the geopolitics because of minerals, resources that whosoever need them want. So we as a country, we as a people, what are we doing? Because you, we see what we are facing, like some of us here are working oil and gas and some of the installation that are in this, uh, you know, Naya Delta are practically gonna be home in the next uh, two months because of flood, because it's coming. And we are told that uh, a lot of the installation is gonna be shut down. Some people are gonna be sent home meaning there's going to be a lot of hunger. Some people are going to be unemployed. There are some people that will be sent home because of flood. And the flood that we are seeing, what is our contribution to the flood? Because on 3rd of September, I listened to an Al Jazeera documentary that talks about our own contribution as a continent in global emission. It's just 4%. I don't know if they have, you know, jacked a little bit. Because even the 4% is South Africa, 
Algeria, and Egypt. We are not contributing anything in what is going on. And we are the one being at the receiving end as a flood is coming. A lot of homes will be sacked. People will now start going into public you know, facility to find shelter. So we need to advocate. We need to educate our people for them to understand that we need to rise up and start looking at our people, start looking at our resources. What can we do with our resources? Us, the company I represent, I'm a founder of Kenyan International. We have seen how we have deliberately as a people still push or still inflict pains in our nation when it comes to oil and gas, you know, vandalism, oil theft, uh, breaking of pipelines and stealing of oils and other stuff. You now discover that we are not helping ourselves. We're not helping our, our, our community, neither are we helping our economy. You discover that we need money. It's financed. Prof, as towards the ending of your slide, you made mention of finance. We need money for us to be able to do what? To build infrastructure. We need money for us to be able to what? To build healthcare. The stolen oil is other continent that are still benefiting it because we are not refining it in Nigeria. It's still other countries, it's still other continent that benefit from them. When they steal the oil, where do they sell them? Because it's not being refined here. What what is the volume of some of these uh, local refineries or these, uh, what is the volume? So you now discover that most of the stolen oil, the large quantity of the stolen oil is being refined in another country. And we know the value chain of refinery, the direct and indirect jobs that refinery create. And that is what I will also try to see how we cannot advocate for our you know, country to revive most of these refineries, to create jobs in these refineries, to make sure we are energy independent. Prof, let me stop here and so that I can allow. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me just take us back a little bit. You remember that uh, during one of the, I think COP, was it the one Buhari attended? There was the issue of, issue of uh, net zero and uh, countries were told to give deadlines. I think Nigeria gave 2060. Then uh, the minister came back and said, our fuel for transition was going to be gas at that particular time. So the issue there is that somebody also said, maybe they may be wrong, that when oil was good, they built America, built Europe, built Scotland, wherever we go to nowadays. Now it's time for us to build Nigeria and build Africa. They said, don't use oil anymore. Forget about oil. Go back to firewood. No, no, firewood is too bad. Go back to, I don't know what to use. So the issue there is that, and I want maybe Prof to address this. This is happening at the time. We need to come out from this meeting with certain issues we think to guide ourselves, particularly Nigeria. Nigeria is the beacon for oil in, in Africa. Everybody looks up to us. They come here to come and learn about NCDMB. They come here to come and learn about that. What is the way forward as Nigeria? What is the direction we should be doing? So that at the end of this meeting, we can say, well, these are the things we propose. I think the way forward. Going, looking against the background of the fact that they gave us 1.7 there about oil production, we can't even meet it. Sometimes we do 1 million. I think last month we do 1.4. There was a lot of clapping for everybody. everybody. I don't know. So, so these are the issues. And then Saudi, of course, and uh, Russia, they decide to cut back to raise price amongst other things. So I want Prof to, against the background of his presentation, to look at this and tell us what do you think Nigeria should be doing at this point in time? What are the policymakers supposed to do? What will be the roles of the academia in terms of championing the experts in the industry going forward in terms of placing Nigeria and Africa on that table? You know, in 1984, they sat at the table and took a knife and shared Africa. And they are trying to do the same thing now for this oil, for this uh, energy transition. So, Prof, is there a knife going to be longer than us? Maybe you need to tell us. Um, I wish to protest uh, th this imposition. My, um, my deal with um, uh, 
Professor Ladere ended with the keynote. I wasn't supposed to be part of this, um, but I was lured onto this stage by Dr. Susan. Where's Susan? I trusted her. She said, just sit on the table and, and look what I got out of it. You know? Um, but while we haven't seen for a while, so I'm going to do this way. The first part was for me, this one is for Wally. Um, one of the history uh, stories, one of the stories from history I wanted to tell you, which, if you're in the mining sphere, mining as a whole, I went to the Royal School of Mines in Imperial College. My thesis was on the origin of petroleum. So people don't know if mining is both solid and liquid. But one of the stories uh, I skipped that is in the um, it's in the write-up, which I have encouraged the organizers to share. I deliberately put, even though time was a constraint, but I continued the narrative. There's something that turned up in the 80s. And I was wide awake in the 80s. I'd taken a doctorate from Imperial College in 1980 after you know being a petroleum engineer uh, in Shell BP. <laughs> the Middle Ages history. But one of the things that played out in the um, 80s was the issue of what became known as dematerialization. It's from where I coined depetroleumization. And it concerned Asia. So what is happening in Africa now is not different from what happened to uh, Asia in the 70s and 80s. The Asian countries had looked into the future and knew they had distinct advantages for shipbuilding, heavy industries, car manufacture, and they had blueprint. Put in experts from across the world, paid them good money, and they made these designs bottom as basis for industrial takeoff. And the industrialized world engineered a slump in the price of um, uh, minerals, solid minerals. The economy tumbled. And the apostles from the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, World Bank, all the think tanks in the US and the UK and Germany flooded the Asian countries telling them, listen, we're going nowhere with solid minerals. You better turn your attention to trade and something else. And sometimes that's why it's good to be a protest. Sometimes it's good to be stopped and to ask pertinent questions. Why? So the Asian countries held their nerves said, no, we know where we're going. We have designs for industrial resurgence, industrial development, and they are based on uh, solid minerals. So instead of relenting in terms of investments, they put in more money, went overseas and invested in Bolivia, Chile, anywhere there were uh, um, solid minerals, including Congo, yeah, they invested and continue. When they saw, if you watch the markets, when they saw that these guys wouldn't give up, they relented, the market bounced back. The, the, the blackmail didn't work. The market bounced back and their industrialization plants were back on track. These Asian countries are what we refer to as Asian tigers today. They are the Asian tigers because they held their nerve. And so that's, that's the story I'm telling, that if anybody says, hey, um, well, what's this? Uh, petroleum is going to die. They will, they will kill it. Don't invest. Don't listen. We've got to hold their nerves. Because like I've tried to tell you, 
the problem is still the future. All, all uh, uh, analysis, put by governments, income, the oil companies themselves, the minerals, industry, private people, show that it's a change in landscape. Certain things will change, but not the new one to continue to play. But men stay beyond 2015 will still be petroleum. That's not my conjecture. Is the, uh, 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 it's what the uh, analysis and what the data were. So I would say, as a country, we must hold our neck. Africans are beginning to come, uh, African countries, now almost everywhere is petroleum in Africa. By the time they allowed this petroleum, it was only four countries, Nigeria, Libya, uh, Gabon, even Angola wasn't out there by the time this, decisions were taken. But now, there are, as of today, almost 30 countries out of the 54 in Africa and counting that will be petroleum producing. And then, like you said, they're saying, leave the petroleum in the ground. For who? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we just have about 10 minutes, so I'll just take a few minutes. But I want somebody who is a player to come in here. And the issue is that a few days ago, Ajib, that is uh, the one here. They are living in Nigeria. They put out their share. They sell everything to uh, Oando. They are, and uh, you know what annoyed me was that they looked at the whole building, the whole assets. They look at the gas plant. Look at everything. I know the price: six hundred million dollars. It's uh, just, 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 just take. They just say, just take and run away. That's what they wanted to do. Exxon is living in Nigeria. Chevron thinking the same thing. Shell, divesting all launch assets. What is the way forward? We say petroleum is there. But then for us to be on the table and we are talking, we must have the reserves. We must have the production. If we don't have that, how can we be player going forward in terms of this? Maybe Shay, you can help. Um, and I can help out there because I, have, I worked 28 years with Exxon Mobil. And so when you say, what should government be doing? You would notice that a lot of the IOCs started packing their bags seriously after the PIA. Because the PIA is a complex document. It does not make any business sense. And so why not? Why won't I leave if I have other options? I've said this before on the platform of Nigerian Content Development Board. Dollar goes to where dollar is best maximized. If I'm going to make more profit somewhere else, I'll take my dollar there. When you have global companies that are working in your country, each company, each country that they're working is contesting for money. And so when you go to the corporate headquarters, what they look at is, if I give you $1 in Nigeria, how much are you going to return back to me? Before the PIA, I used to say that for every dollar that an IOC would declare as profit in Nigeria, 93 cents goes to Nigerian government. They take seven cents home. Yes, and I can prove it. 85% PPT. 3% effective royalty, 88. Education tax, 2%, 90. NDDC, 3% of my OPEX, 3%, 93%. Who does business like that? The only reason why the IOCs remained in Nigeria was because of the volume base. The reserves was huge enough when added to other reserves everywhere else in the world, it becomes, you know, they look like a future company, country, a company. Now, for Exxon, Guyana is it. Everybody's going to Guyana for Exxon. All the money is going to Guyana. Shell is showed up, Shell and Total, and even Exxon have showed up in Namibia because the fiscal terms are friendly. 
in Nigeria, we operate businesses as if we're policing people. Since I retired, I've now become an entrepreneur. And I can tell you that I feel like I'm under a siege from the various tax bodies. Talk about quadruple taxation. You have to pay federal government, you have to pay local government, you have to pay state government, you have to pay custom duties, you have to, you know, there's just so many on NCDMB, 1%. Then you ask yourself, what are they doing with all that money? That, those are the things that we should invest. The reason why NCDM for, NCDMB funds was put there was really to be able to help new entrepreneurs coming up. But they're keeping the money in the banks and you know sharing and giving. Anyway, I would not say much because let's, let's swallow that. But the physical terms are not commensurate with the amount of investment that people have to put out for exploration. And so new frontiers look very attractive. And they go there. Now, what can we do? Let's look at ourselves. The young entrepreneurs are coming in. The indigenous producers are here. Should we also be squeezing them like we, have, we squeezed the IOCs out? Or should we allow them? It's the only, I'm telling you, it's the only country I know that I don't think there's a pioneer status uh, tax holiday. You start business today, the local government, the state government, the federal government want taxes from day one. Thank you, sir. Why? And then we don't see what is being done with the taxes. So the citizens are even, they're struggling to understand, are they paying taxes? If they are paying, why am I not seeing it? And so they vandalize the pipelines. They want to see what is inside. If every one of us is selling petrol, maybe we should sell it together. You know, I think we, are, we should be, we should grow out of what my new vocabulary is for the young Nigerians. Stop being pedestrian. People are going to space and coming back now. Everybody is going to space. In Nigeria, we're still pedestrian. We're stealing things. We're, you know, we're acting like we are thieves, something that belongs to us. Why are we stealing them? And then when Nigerians go out of the country, they go there and prosper. They're, they're the best brains all around the world. The best doctors in the US are Nigerians. The best doctors in the UK are Nigerians. But when you are in your country, you want to steal, you want to be like a thief of what belongs to you. For me, I say to myself first and to a lot of young people, if God in his all infinite wisdom decided that you're a Nigerian, you stay here, you make Nigeria work and make sure that it works for you. I cannot stand the Japa syndrome. Thank you very much. Stay home and don't Japa. That's what they say. You, you make a comment, but I want to give, I'm told that I have just a few minutes. Let's give, you still wrap up, but let's just, if you have contribution, one or two on the floor because uh, we're time bound. Um, uh, where is the MC that was giving me? Can you help me? I can see. Yes. Okay. Uh, I've got one here. If we can take one there, one there. So let's just those who want to speak. That's I'm seeing four hands up now. Yes, I'm seeing four hands. One, two, three, and there's one behind you. No, along that line there. The middle line. How many minutes? How many? Minutes? Okay, so we start. How many minutes? Uh minutes? You got seconds. <laughs> well, I I needed to react to my special guest with respect to the Petroleum Industry Act fiscal framework. Having been part and parcel, I, I if I keep quiet, then I would not be, you know, I, I don't think the the divestment really is because of the PIA. I think it's more of the security issues. And secondly, where they are going, 
was where we were 60 years ago when we gave them everything nearly for free. I can stand on my title as Professor Emeritus. I challenge all their economists to come and debate. The PIA framework that we have today is at par with the PSC 1993 in terms of net present value and internal rate of return. In fact, and they, and I'm on record, are not necessary, they are the one who allowed the PIA to be truncated. And I can debate them anywhere. So I understand your feeling. Yes, yes, you have so many other regulations that are not necessarily as a result of PIA, which they got by the agencies. I don't think it has to be with fiscal regime. I can agree with you if you say it has to do with governance that to me remains ineffective, inefficient, inequitable, and unethical. Perhaps that's what's driving them out, not the fiscal terms in the PIA. By the way, they have not even combated. They are still staying with the old fiscal terms. However, Namibia is just imagined. They don't even understand. They give them the, 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 the acreages the way we gave it to them when they first came here, when they first come to Nigeria. We have matured. I'm not saying the PIA fiscal regime is perfect. The imperfection of it was due to them lobbying. I won't say more than that, but I challenge their chief petroleum economists on AIT or RS television to come and show me what is wrong with the fiscal terms. The royalty is effective, less than 20%. The IS is 15%, and effective royalty is even only 12.5%. They even took Nigerian hydrocarbon tax from deep water, and they truncated what we call the fiscal rule of general application. Instead of having three tranches in deep water, they lobbied and got only two. Oh, come on. My friend, yeah, my friend. I just thank you. To put that in. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Oh. Uh, disclaimer. Okay. First, a disclaimer. I'm not a petroleum engineer. I'm not a petroleum economist. I'm a political economist. I'd like to borrow from Prof. Sibe and protest that my fear is that the message from his lecture is that we should work with the status quo, focus on oil. I think that message would have been a bit subtler, sir, with due respect. Yes, we need petroleum for the foreseeable future, just as we still have firewood just as we still have coal. But we need to start now to look in the direction of what is called renewable energy. Already in the petroleum industry, we're at the very lowest playing level. Is it possible that we can find a new frontier where we can be pioneers, where we can be one of the first to get into the field, especially in Africa when every country is discovering oil? Can we begin to go back to that minister who said our transition to will be gas? Is it possible we can focus on that? The problem with the Nigerian state is that it is losing grip because the ruling class is a thieving class. It is not a productive class. We have to be honest with ourselves. That's why there are all those taxes you talk about. That's why they don't even care about the basic element that any state should provide, security. You carry your goods. Those people who pro, uh, bring goods to Potako from the north, at every stop, you see a military checkpoint. Just before, uh, after that military checkpoint, there's a civilian checkpoint that should not be there harassing those people to give them money. That's another form of tax, man. Right? And those people bring their products. What is happening? By the time they make any profit, and they do make profit, that's why they keep coming. But that profit is reduced. 
It's the same reduction in profit. That's why the IOCs are leaving. As Professor Elada said, because of insecurity. Madam, you pointed out the margin they were taking. If out of every dollar, they were taking 90, uh, 30 cents, seven, whatever the number, sorry. But what made it profitable for them was the turnover, the quantities. When the quantities are no longer there because they're stolen, and who are behind the stealing? The state. With due respect. Because if the state wanted to stop it, they could stop it. But it is profitable not to stop it. So we need to get discipline. We need to get, in my opinion, find a new frontier in the energy industry where we can become good players. And that's where these young people you are talking about can come in. Use their imagination. Use their initiative and push Nigeria in a direction where in green and renewable energy, where a power to be contented with in petroleum, we will not be that power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please, let's make our conclusion very brief. Very, very brief. Please, please, because we're running out of time. Be as brief as possible. I would like to say that I'm very disappointed with the academia and the academic world with their response to Nigeria's development. Members of the university community all over Nigeria are sure about what the problem is. The problem is simple, stealing. You can be a thief and plan. The heads, the leaders of this country are stealing from their country. They can plan for good. I was in an NPC at the topmost level from 1995 till now. It's all been plotting on how to steal. Oando, AP, Unipetrol, they were bought for nothing, peanuts. They forced an NPC to sell them for peanuts. That was stealing. Today, you mentioned Egypt is going for 600 million or whatever. What's happening? Oando bought 20%, unable to pay cash call. The same Oando is going to buy Ajib. How does it work? But the PIA, which is the main crux, it is a bundle of documents planned for stealing. I tell you, from 1995, they had vision 2010. Sorry, they had divestment from the upstream. We stopped it. I have to stop it. Over 60%. Ask of Dr. Airline and NPC, they'll tell you. They went to Vision 2010. You know how much they spent? Nigeria spent putting people in Hilton to plan for Vision 2010. The outcome of Vision 2010, divestment from the upstream. What did academia say? When they said divestment from the upstream, what does it mean? You sell your investments in upstream. What your investment there? Your oil and gas reserve. So we killed Vision 2010. That's why nothing in this country happened out of Vision 2010. They created NAPIMS Limited in 1998, 99, when Abu was just about going. They said, after a document had been done for president to sign, they stole it and sneaked in a clause that from now henceforth, NAPIMS shall be constituted to a limited liability company and all the oil and gas in Nigeria should be vested in NAPIMS. If you, if you, if you Google NAPIMS Limited, you will see it. Do you see any decree in this country that promulgated and repealed? We made sure it was repealed within two months. The members of the academia didn't do anything. If you want to repeal, you will be talking about PIA today. The idea was to get Happiness Limited and get them to sell up, divest all the oil and gas to two or three individuals. After that, they embarked on the PIB. The PIB was embarked on how to steal oil. The first bill was to divest 55% of the oil and 50% of the gas. So for today, if you want to pass, if that was passed, you know what I mean? Today, the first thing you would have been seeing would have been this, the divestment. That would have been the first thing they would do. What did I do? I went to the governor of Rivers State. I had retired. And the governor of Rivers State sent me to Senate. And Rivers State would only stay at President Paper. And we said, you can't do this. No, that's the President of Paper. That's why that PIB was not signed, which was to divest everything. They moved from 2009, it's 2009, 2012. They said they would divest 10%. Then the burger was somewhere there. You remember? Rough, round up. Uh, okay. Round up, round up. Then what happened? We destroyed it. It couldn't go. Then Kachuku came in, 2015. He brought something great. You thought he was great. No. He said, oh, we'll break it into five places. We'll start with governance building. Nobody said, 
we must divest no less than 30 percent. When somebody says that, he said divest 100 percent. Even Buhari, as funny as you thought he, he, he was, he didn't sign it because I went to a seminar. Prof was there. You remember the economic seminar at Abuja? And I said to them, if the president signs this, he has signed off himself also. And the bill was passed by the CEDEC, passed by the House of Rep Reps, but was never signed. Now, you know what they did? This one, they didn't put that. What are they said whenever Nigeria was in distress, they will divest from time to time any percentage in a, in a fair and a transparent manner, isn't it? That's how they put it, because they still want to divest. But you know what they did? They now moved the oil from the Federation on this bill, from the Federation to the federal government, Nigeria Delta people are quiet. University people are quiet. Everybody's quiet. Why? This is stealing. How we moved it to PIA, you know what happened? The very first presidential advisors, continue, you know what they said? Federal government should exit and NPC Limited. Did you not hear that? Did you react? Where are the professors? Where are those people who said the experts? They couldn't say anything. What it means is that when federal government exits, who takes its place? Oando or the rest? Stealing cannot move a country forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Prof, what do you want professors to do? To carry their wig and gown and go and demonstrate? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry we cannot take more questions. But a number of things. You know, this particular kind of events was first hosted by Dr. Goga way back in Abuja. I was part of that round table at uh, Nikon. No, is it what they was called that time? Was it uh, Transcorp now at that particular time, many years ago? And many people may not know in this room that I was uh, in this room. I can claim to be the first person the Goga taught because he taught me when I was a 100 level student at the University of Ibadan at that particular, before he went to do his PhD. Then he had a master's degree at that particular time. So you can see that the filial relationship extends beyond that. But what I will ask is that if you were here today in the situation Nigeria found itself, what would be the recommendation going forward? I'm not too sure that in my mind, I have not been able to get us to land on those issues. Because for me at any meeting, I believe that we should go away with some whole, some concrete issues. I've not been able to land them, unfortunately. But um, uh, maybe time is against us, but maybe we'll go around pondering. Let it be a continued discussion. But we do have a challenge. We must we have a big challenge. Also, when I saw the Minister of Petroleum for Oil, one Mr. Lokopri Hennikin, I don't know whether it's beer or star beer or, or which one of them. But I said Hennikin, maybe he likes to drink that one. Then that's then the one for gas is one of that guy from somewhere. Uh, I don't know. Is he a petroleum engineer? I don't know. Uh, do, you, do you know him? The man Mr. Petroleum for, for gas. I don't know. But the issue is that, you know, is it? Politician. Ah, OK. Oh, politics of gas, maybe. So, but that's the issue. You need people who have an understanding of, we're talking about issues of geopolitics. And for me, these oil companies that are living, this one going, this one doing that. Are we seeing the voice of Jacob or the hand of, the hand of Esau and the voice of Jacob? I don't know. Is it possible that that's what we are saying? For those of you who read the Bible, you know, you have Jacob, sweet voice, but uh, put here on his hand to be like Jacob, be like uh, Esau. Are we seeing that in this particular case? And it's going to be continuous, particularly when we can't even meet up. What are the roles of our indigenous companies? The independents, what are they doing? Can they fill the gap? Nigeria needs money. Now, today, Naira is going for about 930 to 150 to the dollar. Poverty is hitting the land. They are distributing one cup of rice to several people to eat. So you begin to wonder, rice, one bag of rice, several families, uh, Indomie, two of you share one uh, Indomie to eat. When that finishes, what happens? You drink water. So, so the issue is that we have a lot to think about. I think the challenges are ahead. I think this colloquium has not ended. I believe that um, there are more questions that have been raised than even answers. For me, I believe that there's more to be talked about. Prof, you are talking about trying to rebut here to, to report what it said, but I don't don't worry. Just don't worry. Don't so, um, because of time constraint, I was virtually doing uh hop, step, and jump. And in the process, maybe for a second, okay, you listening? 
Uh, because of time constraint, I was virtually doing hop, step, and jump in my presentation. And you can see me skipping slides. Maybe something was lost. But um, I, I have taught for Wumi here when he was the director of this institute after he came back. And uh, he's always asked me back and to his international presentations in Abuja and elsewhere, because two of us believe in achieving a rational mix of energies. What I stated was that a wholesale embrace of the zero net strategy as presented to us globally will be an embrace of you know, economic debt. But I teach energy security management at the uh, to senior officers at the Nigerian uh, Academy. I've always insisted that you need a good balance between renewables and conventional. A one-line track is a dangerous track. A kill petroleum strategy is a one-track strategy and can never be a, a viable strategy. So if I missed that point, uh, that's why I thought that the chairman should give me a few seconds to make the clarification. I believe in the rational energy mix as the basis for energy security of any nation, whether developed or developing. You cannot put all your eggs in one basket. You cannot tell us leave the petroleum in the ground and go for renewables. But there's intermittency problems, etc. What do you do with those? The EU, I said, budgeted two, two trillion to solve those problems. They have not scratched the surface. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. You know, the uh, many of you don't know the challenge I have there. The, each time I say we want to round up, somebody pinches me at the back and says he wants to say something. I'm sure on the floor, some other people want to talk. You know, some people say the voice of uh, people is voice of God. I don't know whether they want to say something that will maybe tickle us. If you don't mind, maybe you should give them one minute. You want to say something? Just a minute, please. Let's be very brief. And on my right, too, he's also picking. And I'm sure if, if you allow them to reach me, they will have been telling me they want to say something. So I don't know. Uh, MC, are you giving us more time? <laughs> because the mood of the house is that they want to say something. And do we deny them that? Uh, please, you just give them, but let me, let's make it very, very brief so that in the next 10 minutes, we are out. Please. Just to uh, sort of um, <laughs> support what Prof Ibe was saying, you know, if we say only petroleum, then we are wrong. Because, I mean, diversification is important and all that. Now, I can never pass up the opportunity when I see young people to say a few things. The petroleum industry for Nigeria is sort of well-defined. We know from exploration to abandonment, and we know what we will do eventually with all the facilities that are out there if oil were to go completely you know, off the radar. Now we're talking solar and we're talking wind. I believe that this is a university and so research should be going on now about the abandonment of batteries. What are we going to do with all those batteries? Inverters today, people have a lot of inverter batteries in their homes. What are you doing with those in inverter batteries? If we leave them in the ground, the lithium is going to soak into the table water. We're going to pollute the world even worse than what petroleum is doing today. So it's a research institute. Let's start thinking about what is the abandonment plan when we all convert to solar and we are carrying batteries all over the place. Thank you. Great challenge, great challenge. But maybe before I come to you, let me also mention that we talk of energy. We have the fossil fuel, we have the renewable energy. Now, the major issue in renewables has to do with these minerals, lithium and the rest of them in Africa. 
So, can we begin to see that as another cash cow where Nigeria or Africa can play a role in terms of this? I mentioned the wars all over because in Mali, Cameroon, Niger, and the rest of them. Notice a common denominator in those areas. Is there a role? I know there's a course we used to teach in petroleum engineering called is it alternative energy and all that. We must begin to think of those areas. I don't think I saw lithium in those notes that they were writing at that particular time. I'm not too sure I saw them. So please, let's begin to revise those notes and bring all these factors to play in those areas. Thank you very much, Prof. I think just to add to what you just said, uh, uh, the new government should focus on mineral, you know, solid minerals, because there is a lot and a lot of illegal mining going on in the country. Uh, in my state, Aquire, they just... Uh, uh, Accosted some people that were mining lithium. I didn't know my state had lithium. Yeah, so it, it was in the news, I think, last week or so. So we need to, as a country, need to, you know, step up our, our research when it comes to solid minerals uh, as the world is moving towards renewable energy. Just to add to um, what uh, the prof said um, or the question that was asked, about why the IOCs are, are leaving and bring it to the context of our lecture today that has to do with uh, the geopolitics. Uh, we will all understand that uh, Nigerian oil and gas is mature. Uh, it's not in the early stage. And uh, some other countries that are coming in at the early stage, they will come with a lot of incentive, trying to see how to drag other companies to join them. And as businesses, when you look at your numbers and check your, if you invest here, what is going to be your, you know, your RI, you invest there, what is going to be, uh, definitely you're going to leave here to go and invest there. And if you check most of these countries that most of these IOCs are going, uh, these are countries they are practically going to do 100% and zero local content. And uh, you look at the likes of uh, the Guyana you mentioned, look at some of those country you will discover that uh, what is going to be the local com you know, content participation. And so it's going to be almost uh, 90 something uh, profit you know, return. So you need to look at the economics that comes into this and you need to understand that Nigeria as an oil and gas entity is getting matured and there is a lot of local you know, participation. And those IOCs, when they see greener pastures anywhere, they need to invest definitely they will go to invest. So it's for our people here, yeah, the independents that are going to take over some of this asset to make meaningful use of this asset to make sure that there is there is two, two value chain in our addition into this asset. Thank you very much, my prof. Thank you. I think um, we'll probably need to round up here today. But for me, I think the issue is that um, so that we're not speaking to ourselves, because I believe that whatever we'll talk about here, there should be a way to get this to people who may want to hear. The director is not here, Professor Ajenka is here. Is it possible at some point to see how some of the things that have been elicited here can be cascaded at least to people who can hear some of this? Because policies are made, things are done, decisions are brought to us, and then we we'll just sink and then we we'll go home. So once we leave this hall now, we all go home. Maybe the director of leader is here. Is it possible to be able to distill some of these ideas and move them forward? That is, what is the way forward? What are the future frontiers? Where will Nigeria be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years' time? That's part of the reason why this building, this center was set up. To be able to generate ideas in terms of these areas. The geopolitics of oil. Because what we are doing, oil is political. You know, it is... It's just like there's politics in everything. Even if you go to a church, there is politics in church. So, but the issue there is that there's, everybody has self-interest. And Prof mentioned something. He said geopolitics and talk about self-preservation. You want to self-preserve yourself. You don't want to self-destruct. I think that is what it is. So, uh, in view of the time constraints, I want to thank members of the panel for a wonderful job. Jay, thank you so much for all the time you've taken. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Kenyon, Sorry, I don't know. We've met several times. We're always on panels together, you know? So uh, the only thing is that I'm not happy. You know, when the major companies go, the IOCs go, my consultancy suffers because the money I get reduces. 
because the small operators cannot drill all the wells. You know, when the operators are there, when they drill 20 wells, then I know that even if I service one well, I can relax for the whole year. Because if they pay me a few thousand dollars and I go to the bank, my, I need a pickup to carry the Naira home. So, but I'm worried also. So leaving this meeting, I think I need to go and uh, I, I'm very worried. I'll tell my doctor to check. <laughs> so thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for your time. Thank you for standing here. And as a role for the academia, please, for research, we need to direct our research in terms of areas that are important. Areas that are relevant. Don't do research for the case of the shelf. Do research that are relevant so that when you live here, your research can have a bearing on national politics. No national policies and the way things are done. And maybe also, this, uh, we should also not leave uh, politics to politicians alone, alone. Professionals should begin to think, if you are not at the table when meat is being shared, you may not get anything. In fact, you may get the bone at the end of the day. So let me thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for inviting us to talk. I believe that we have not ended this story. I wish there will be opportunities for us to be able to elevate this to a further level. Thank you. Have a safe trip. And may God bless you all. You agree that Professor Josumi did an amazing job as the panel chair. Please, can we give a round of applause, please? Celebrate him. Thank you. And thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please hold on. Hold on. We are not wrapped. We are not done yet. I'm made to understand that there is item six. There's always jollof rice at the end of this kind of event. So please have your seat. I will give you the directions on where we are going to have our, our dinner. But before then, we'd like to, please, a round of applause for all of them, please. A good photo here on stage. Okay. We have questions. We have a lot of questions. If you check page four, of your bulletin, you're going to see the website of this foundation. Please go there. You're going to see the recordings, the presentations, and then you can see the email. Please send your questions to the email on page four. Thank you. We are going to switch gears right now to sponsors remark, and we would like to also give them a little gift. Ladies and gentlemen, please to present these items to the sponsors. We'd like to welcome Professor Wumi as he takes center stage for the presentation of souvenirs to all of our sponsors. Of course, the very first sponsor we'll be celebrating is Kenyon International West Africa, the amazing engineer, Ekpeyong, Victor Ekpeyong, is at the center there. Oshas, thank you so much. Can you celebrate Kenyon if you want to come for this legacy lecture series next year? I believe next year they would support again. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. This is my first time of attending this lecture, and I so much love it, and I appreciate the organizers and I appreciate the foundation of trying to keep the legacy of this wonderful man, Dr. Emmanuel. I appreciate our prof, you know, Professor Me, you know, reaching out, and we will always like to be part of this success story, or we like to be part of these organizations that are trying to bring the legacy of Dr. Emmanuel. Thank you very much. So Kenyon is proud to be a sponsor and we all will want to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful foundation. Thank you, my pro. Thank you very much, Victor, for, for coming. Uh, Lisa Engineer, I mean, Lisa Engineering, is there a representative there? You, can you collect it on his behalf? Uh, and make sure you get it to him, yeah. Uh, Lisa has been, uh, Professor Yekan has been a very, uh, very, very support of this vision. Uh, uh, Chairman Newcross, 
as new cross here. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. MD Victor, we want to thank you very much for your annual support of this event. Uh, we'll continue to try to make you proud. Thank you. We'll get it to you. And uh, Oida Energy. Oida. And Zenergy Oilfield Services Limited. Oil data limited. All, all, the, all data is there any? Okay, we'll, we'll get, all data. We'll give. We'll find a way to get it to table. Thank you. Petronet Africa Energy Resources Development Associates Limited. Yeah, managing partner. Professor Adjenka, please. Petronet. Well, we. Well, thank you, managing partner, for supporting the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> SQL Exploration and Production Services. Any representative? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, please make sure the MD ETA is uh, aware that we sincerely appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this event. I had a wonderful time. And thank you for to Professor Chidi. I was telling him I'm a student of international relations, and I felt like a student raising up their hand to want to give a rebuttal to all his lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, to the Foundation, for putting this together, and definitely Sequest will continue to be a sponsor to this inaugural event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you celebrate her, please? Walter Smith, Petrol Man Oil Limited. Well, Walter Smith, we also want to express our profound gratitude. You've supported this uh, event over the last, uh, since we started. And uh, we pray that all our sponsors, boundary lines, will continue to fall into pleasant places for you. Uh, this is a noble uh, opportunity to educate and to share the vision of uh, Dr. E over the years. It's about prosperity for posterity. And we see some of these as sponsors really believe in this and uh, we thank you all for sponsoring the event. Thank you, sir. You're supposed to do a voice of thanks. I want to believe. Okay, please go ahead, sir. Well, I... First, I must uh, thank you all for sitting through this uh, opportunity. In fact, Dr. E is very pro students. And even after the passing, I was literally directed that this uh, Emmanuel Google lecture cannot leave University of Port Harcourt. Uh, and that's why we, we kept coming to make sure that we exposed the students to this okay. type of uh lecture so i really appreciate your sitting and waiting and i genuinely meant it from the bottom of my heart and i i really thank you i must also express profound uh, appreciation to the keynote speaker a man that is in uh right. say 90s <laughs> Stand, <laughs> standing for hours to actually uh deliver a noble lecture let me let me, let me read something that someone sent to me. Someone who is noble uh, about that lecture, and maybe that will help. I won't mention the name of the fellow, but I just thought it is worthy to mention. The fellow sent me a text message when the message was going on. That is what he said about the lecture. This is the most radical, most interesting lecture I've yet listened to. Please circulate it. This nation must listen to this lecture. I am prepared to sponsor its wide circulation. 
I will keep the name of the person who sent this text message to me as a secret. And I would, you would in fact, and without, this is the essence of this institute in the original thinking. That was the essence. And we are delighted, we must appreciate the director of the institute, we must appreciate the university community for welcoming this engaging lecture back to the, where it was bad. And we give our pledge to continue to do this as the good Lord enables us. Let me also thank the Society of Petroleum Engineers for their willingness to continue to partner with us going forward. Now they are going to add this to the arsenal of the lectures that they do every year. So we appreciate the Society of Petroleum Engineers for endorsing and being a partner with us. It is also important for me to mention specifically some member of the SP Board of Trustee who out of their generous heart donated individually to this event. Uh, let me spare them of their names, but they know them, about six of them personally donated money to make sure that we do not run aground and do it takes money to do this type of thing. But when you are prosperous, it is inconsequential if it doesn't have posterity attached to it. Prosperity without posterity is inconsequential. And that's what you see in the land. That's what you see in the land. I must also express profound gratitude to two individuals who literally have been a pillar for the Manuel Egoga Foundation, the seventh vice chancellor of the University of Port Harcourt, Professor Ajeka, who lured me. Did somebody say that? Yes, to this place. I must also thank my general manager, Dr. Susan Ubara for her perfection. If you are gifted, you can order two elderly, you could eminent and distinguished professor along the line that you want thing to go. And that's what Susan has done. And I want to publicly appreciate the effort that he has made. I want to also express profound gratitude to the Egoga family for believing in us. And the essence of this is to add value to the society. And that was the essence of Egoga himself. He left everything to come to Nigeria to add value. And that's why we are committed to make sure that that vision of value creation is continually propelled. But it would take a family to not listen to innuendos to understand that Ajenka and myself are committed because of the value that uh, Dr. E created in us. And so I want to thank you again uh, sincerely grateful to the IPS students uh, for joining this lecture. You are graduate students. And if there's something I can give to you, graduate education is voluntary. Undergraduate education is not. And then graduate education is about creating a niche for yourself beyond just passing an exam. I want to thank you again, and I want to thank the university, the chairman of the panel, the panelists. Uh, it, my heart is gladdened because the essence of the energy we put into doing this is not in vain. As to what Nigeria should do, it's easy. We, and Nigeria must disavow rebendalism and embrace a transformational mindset. Transactionalism and tribendalism is destructive. Transformational mindset is a shared vision beyond now. The future is in your hand. You must not do what your parents did that had a negative value to the growth of a nation but it will take a purposeful mindset. Otherwise, Nigeria can get you. May Nigeria not get you. 
Adini Ayeme. Yes. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very tough. Thank you so much, sir. Your Excellencies, very distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the 12th edition of this Legacy Lecture Series. However, the conversation on energy transition and energy security does not end. Thank you and thank you for being part of us. And would like to announce that the venue for the dinner is the IPS. Once you go out of the door, the main exit, you see a small door on the gate. Just pass through that small door, and of course, dinner would be served. At this juncture, please, can you give all yourself a resounding round of applause for being amazing, for being phenomenal? And I believe I will see you at the 13th edition, right? For all of our participants online, thank you. Thank you. We can see your comments. We can see your questions. We can see all of your reservations. Like you said earlier on, go to the website, drop your questions. Go to the website. You would see an opportunity where you can download the slides and also download the recordings. Thank you and thank you. My name is Ophophono Noakan. And my pleasure to us serving as your master of ceremonies. Bye till next year. Bye.